Um, uh, welcome to the session 10 of the master class in audio. Uh, we resume where we left off at uh, session 9 with uh, two giants of uh, audio and acoustics, uh, Ron Sorrow and John Brandt, the third. So, as always, uh, like the previous session, I'll allow Marsban to just uh, uh, lead the session. Uh, but just to set the protocols for the session, uh, I have mentioned that in the chat window. Uh, I request everyone, uh, barring uh, the four of us, uh, to uh, mute your audio uh, and also turn off your video. And uh, questions can be posted on the chat window uh, as and when they come into anyone's uh, mind. Uh, if there is a relevant question uh, at any point of time, I'll I'll pose that to John as well as Ron. And uh, otherwise, the questions can be posted towards the end of the session. So yeah, over to you, Masban. So guys, welcome again to another session of Masterclass with all of us. Uh, today we have, uh, again, our two top guys, uh, John Brandt and Ron Sauer. And this time, John's going to be taking the lead. Uh, as you all know, John has been in the music uh, business right after high school. He was an FOH engineer. Mm -hmm. And he's also worked with uh, Fleetwood, ex-Fleetwood Mac member, Jeremy Spencer, who's his friend today. He also toured Europe in the 70s until 76 when he moved to the UK. Am I right, John? I, I, I saw you grimacing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, let's see. It was 70, uh, 76. Yeah, 76. It was 76. And yeah. then you studied, you started your electronics and acoustics studies at, in the UK in 76. Mm. And also well, you I ran sound electronics and a lot of and, clubs. Uh, yeah. Acoustics and electronics for way before that. Way, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was uh, getting books and making stuff yeah so great so anyway so uh, john's uh very very experienced in studio design that's his main forte actually listening space design he also designs large spaces like or you know uh, stadiums and auditoriums and 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 studios in fact aren't, aren't you uh shortlisted for one of the most largest mosques in the middle east isn't that what you not a mosque no uh, uh, uh they contacted me uh, as acoustic designer for a uh, music uh, music music King Hassel, uh, music center it's it's huge it's absolutely huge in saudi arabia we'll see we'll see i've got you know uh three companies actually asking me if i would be their acoustic consultant so i just sent them all the same thing basically we'll see so I've got I've got three lottery tickets instead of one. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's fantastic, know. John. But uh, today, what we want to discuss uh, and where we left off is uh, home theater design, and we want to understand your process, how how you go about it. Um, what are the basic room ratios uh, that you'd like to use, which which really give you good results. Uh, what are the kind of acoustic treatments that you use? Where do you place them in the room? Uh, what are the basic calculations that you need to like, you know, get out of the way? And then uh, after, how do you uh, choose loudspeakers which go into uh, these rooms? You know, I mean, their dispersion patterns, their, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what do you call it in the in their horns, their um, directivity and and stuff, and also. Um, this, this uh, the the constant argument of um, quadratic residue diffusers, scatterers, uh, reflectors. How does one choose what's best for a particular room to end up with really a great sounding home theater room? I mean, uh, I know uh, yes, stereo is also around, but since a lot of us in this field, uh, you know, specialize or do a lot of home theaters rather than studios and stereo listening rooms uh we wanted to take up this topic because i know it's endless and and you could like you know take it up from your thought process and how you start off on a blank sheet okay. and how do we go from there okay um starting off first of course we we discussed a little bit on soundproofing last time right uh so once you have your place soundproofed enough so that you're not disturbing anybody and they're not disturbing you we start with we go well you don't you got to figure out room ratio first and it's not just the ratios because ratios as they are you know you can look at the Sipmeyer, the the Loudon or the Bolt or whatever uh, they don't just work out of the box you have to you know they'll get you close and then you have to run the numbers in a good calculator and what I do if if you don't mind I'll share for example 
I'll share a, a room mode calculator. This is available on my resources page. You just download it, either metric or imperial. Since you guys are imperial and most people in the States are imperial, I'll just, I'll run an imperial one here and share. Um, here's, here's one, for example. Um, let me just share my screen here. I got this uh, ATEM I can use. Let's see. So we don't need that. Here's a, um, the, the, the what you call it. All right. Let's say we want to put in these numbers. Now, this one's already calculated for something. And I've, I've done a little um, algorithm here that tells if the, if the, if the frequency of, or the mode above this one is too close to it. So this one is 0.3 hertz, but it's an oblique mode. And obliques are so weak that I kind of disregard them as far as problems with axials. So I'm looking for axial and tangent issues. So this tangent is close to the oblique, so it's not going to cause a, a drone or a resonance issue. Uh, this axial right here at 133.8 will most likely cause a droning at 133 hertz. So this is less than optimal. So anyway, we go to the ratios. We can look at bolt is one that is commonly referred to in uh, as the go-to ratio. However, using these hardly ever works out of the box. I mean, you just you can plug in these numbers. Nope, no go, no go. Even sometimes they, don't, they won't even meet Vanello. So you have to play with it a little bit. Setmeyer one and two are often, they, they quite often do work right out of the box, but you should play with them. Like for example, let's say we have a 10 foot ceiling. So that's 120 inches. And we look at, let's take Setmeyer one. We got 158 square feet area, and we just squeeze past the bare minimum of, of 1,500 cubic feet, which is 42 cubic meters for the metric. Uh, so let's plug in these numbers. It's like I need to write them down because I've got a mind like a steel sieve. If I look at these numbers, they, they won't stick. So okay. uh, the question that I've always wondered in all these calculations is, are these figures of length, breadth, height, uh, the bare shell, or this is after you've done your isolation? This is the, the inside finished dimensions of the room. Okay. This is so, after acoustic treatments also? No, 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 no. The acoustic right, treatments right. Won't, won't change the basic resonances. Now, we've had, there's been some arguments. Uh, about that where you know because that's how fiber trapping or when you have a uh, when you have broadband absorption in the room the way it works is it slows down that 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 that, that wave it slows the, the 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 propagation of the of the sound wave slows it down okay so if you add all that up it will change very slightly your resonance, but it's not enough to worry about. I, I've ever experienced, never changed it enough to change your like membrane traps that are tuned to your tuned to a a, a primary mode modal resonance. Um, no, it doesn't change sound sound uh, the speed of sound. Uh, like, for instance, if you think it changes the speed of sound, put rock wool on your ears and listen to music and see if it go is going slower. It doesn't. It, it's not, you know, but it's get, it's getting up. Uh, it's that's the mechanism that it, it that is used to absorb, to turn it to heat. The process, it's the inertia, the inertia hitting a, 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 a mass and bending it. And that causes. Uh, um, uh, um, attenuation, absorption. Um, Ron can make it a little more clear if I'm going out there. But um, anyway, let's go back to the, the the room mode calculator. So we can we can cover some of this later. On okay, how, how absorption actually works. Right, right. Um, 
I just wanted to I, I I just wanted to say a little something about the the the, the slowing down of the sound wave. Um, that's that's part of it, but it's it's not going to affect your resonances. You want to do your calculations based on the finished interior shell. I mean, that's with all the drywall and whatever you're doing for soundproofing and finishing. Okay, so we're going to start with I I run that calculation. We got. 120 here, 137 here, and 167 here. All right, and then I'll do the macro function of this calculator, and we have a problem here. See this? 98 and 98. That's that's point says it's 0 0.1 hertz part, but maybe this little disparage discrepancy between these two, but that's that's a resonance there. That's a problem. So we have to change the width so that we could make we could make this either go lower or higher. So we could make the, it wider or narrow. I'd rather go a little wider. Let's try uh, an odd number like uh, hmm, one, 141. See what happens to that actually. See what see it push that push that problem away. So our next problem area is right here at 169, 100, almost 170 hertz. Let's see, our shutter frequency is 152. It's well past it. It'll, I'd like to see it get up to 216 before we hit any problems. But honestly, this, this area here, where did I have it? Uh, where was it? This, 169 is definitely trappable. And uh, I don't, I what I want to avoid is anything below the Schroeder frequency of the room that causes a resonance because you're really not gonna be able to trap it as far as, at least in my experience. Um, John, you might wanna explain what the Schroeder frequency uh, is yeah. and how to calculate it. Okay, here is the calculation. The calculation is built into this, but the calculation is, ta-da, speed of sound and the, what was it, D7. I'm, I'm gonna have to go back to this and look at this. This is the, this is the square, the cubic feet of 102. In 102 is, oh, that's a hidden thing. No, it's not. Two. Okay, so that's the, the mean free time or the decay in, in the room. The decay spec, which is another calculation. <laughs> it's based on all that. And that'll tell you where you have basically the wave region breaks into the diffusive region. And it goes up to, on, in this room, it'll go up to uh, 600 hertz. And then that breaks into the ray region. And from about 600 to 650s in that in this area this is never abruptly defined it's about here according to the calculations it's here but you can count on any frequencies from this and up to be pretty much laser beam okay as far as the way they bounce yeah uh, this, guys just just so you're aware i i'm sorry john to interrupt you here but it please. make it a little simpler um there's two uh, methods of calculating sound out there. One is called ray tracing, and the other part is wave theory. Yes. Okay. Uh, ray tracing is based on light. So if you have reflections coming from certain places, hey, they, they follow Snell's law, pretty much. Okay. When you get into wave theory, now you get into the idea that the wave is larger than the surface you're looking at. And therefore, it may or may not see the surface. So it may go around the surface like water would go around up here. And, and that's the difference. And that's what you're looking at is where in the room at what frequency does, does the light theory stop, which is what most of the modeling programs use, versus wave theory, which is what FEM uses, BEM, stuff like that. Okay? Yes, 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 yes. The, uh, this... Um, so it's 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 really is from from 152 153 hertz here down to the lower frequency 
a wave limit of the room, which is 40, 40 hertz in this room. This is a small room. It's uh, This is the smallest room you really want to, if you're building something, don't build it any smaller than this. When you say the wave limit of the room, do you mean uh, the lowest frequency that can be, that is audible in that room? Uh, not really. No, 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 no. You can hear stuff if it's, if it's reproduced. Here's the trick. Uh, you know, if you can reproduce a wave in, th in, this, in the room of this size here, uh, below 40 hertz, say 30 or 25 hertz, if you can reproduce it, you can hear it. But the thing is, if you have a ported loudspeaker, it, it, the box tends to kind of dissolve and disappear past this, this region where the, the room, the actual room enters into pressure region. So the whole room is dominated by pressure below this point. And no, no amount of treatment is needed because there's no bouncing. It's just pressure change, see? So below this frequency, it's quite linear, though you do not have what we call room gain. Room gain is modal support, which is modes, these guys. These guys are your friends. They're not your enemies, but you have to get them lined up like good little soldiers, you know? <laughs> okay, <laughs> troops, <laughs> you know, parade formation. Anyway, so... Um, one that's... of the things that you have... Yeah, one of the things you have to be concerned about here is how do you treat the room? As long as you have modes, you can treat it with both velocity and pressure. Yes. Okay, but as soon as you go below that point, you only have pressure functions. Yes. So right. Therefore, the velocity material has no effect on any of it. Correct. Yes, yes okay. indeed. So that, yes. that's really where, where we talk about things like diaphragmatic absorbers instead of uh, things like fiberglass and stuff like that. So, so when you get below that point, you can no longer use those other, those other tools. Right. You can only use that one tool that's available to you. Uh, actually, there's two tools that are available to you at that point in time. And one is a diaphragmatic action, and the other is 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 like the uh, tuning of a, a tube, like a, a like a organ tube or something like this. Okay, so those are the only two ways you can really treat them at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. just resonates basically. Resonance, so, resonance. All right. Yep. So this room is. Now we've got it figured out. It's not bad. It passes Oscar Bonello's criteria. You can see blue is higher than reds or level. And uh, the distribution, you see the, the points here are all pretty evenly spaced. It's not a bad room at all. It's little, but uh, this will do. And um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's, what we, that's what we do first is figure out a good dimension. Once you have these, these dimensions set, you can be pretty sure that it's when you treat it, it's just going to be right. Uh, you don't have any um, resonances that you, you know you're going to have to deal with. If, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you try to treat a room with resonance issues, it's like trying to tune an organ pipe by stuffing rags in it. It just doesn't work, you know? You don't tr tune your trumpet by, you know, damping it or anything like that. You, you change the length of the pipe. So that's what we do. We change the length of the room or the height of the room or the width of the room. And that fixes it in, in physics right there. So, so could I, would I be right in saying that once I get my room ratios right, the amount of acoustic treatment that I need reduces in a room or no, is, is really. non-existent kind of? No, 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 no. There's no. always going to be uh, acoustic treatments in the room. Acoustic treatment is for acoustic control. Oh. You want to control the space. You want to control what sound does in that room. Now you can go into a room that is solid concrete or really fresh, thick drywall everywhere, painted and polished, and it's an echo chamber. I mean, it's, you don't, it doesn't have a reverberation time more than a second, but it'll sound, it'll feel like that. And it'll be hard to understand a conversation in there, even though it's a small room, because it's, it's just, it's too everything everywhere all at once. 
Um, so you have to control it. You, when you when you sit down to listen to music or watch a movie, whatever, you you need to be able to locate, you know, what the producer had placed in the program material where, you know, this the horse rides in from the right and passes to the left. You're going to hear it doing that, you know. Um, if a, somebody walks in or opens a door over here, you're going to hear that. You go looking at the left side of the screen, waiting for them to come in. See, that's the idea. But if it's, the room is all echo, you're not going to hear. You're not get. You're not get, going to get location at all if you're listening Mark, to music. Hmm? Yeah, Mars, you asked a question much earlier, and that was the size of the room uh, calculation. Is this finished room or not finished room? And what this is, is whatever is bounding this room in a non-movable way. So you can have treatments on the inside, all kinds of stuff. But you finally eventually get to the walls that don't move. That's what that is describing. Okay. So that, that is going to describe the space at which the, the sound rattles around inside. It doesn't move any of the uh, boundaries of any kind. And that's all that's for. Now you will treat on top of that. So you'll maybe make this room smaller physically with different treatments and stuff. But that doesn't mean that the sound doesn't get through those treatments back to these boundaries. So this is the this is like when we build an anticode chamber, we put wedges inside of it. But what counts is where the walls are that hold the wedges. Okay. So it's just kind of the same thing. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, um, so yeah, so we call it the hard boundary or the hard walls, the finished interior, finished partitions, um, floor, ceiling. Oh, and you know, if you add after you calculate your room, you decide, okay, I want to put this uh, this 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 pad treatment, and then I want to put laminated or or a uh, or a hardwood flooring in there, and you end up raising it about an inch, inch and a half. It's going to change your modal calculations. So be aware of that. You need to add all this stuff in when you do your, your measurements, okay? Uh, do the calculations. And the way I design any room, whether it's home theater or, or, or recording studio, I go inside out. So I put in the dimensions in and then I build it out according to what layers of whatever we're putting on, what kind of flooring we're putting on, what kind of you know, slab or whatever is there, or a it's going to be upstairs, it's going to be a floating floor, whatever it's designed from inside out. <clears throat> and we apply the appropriate soundproofing necessary for that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's finished to that. Now, one thing that I do add to studios, thanks to Ron, studios and uh, home theaters is a curved rear wall that'll break up the pressure wave front from the speakers. You, you can have some, uh, some powerful wave fronts coming in a studio and in a, in a theater. So if, if you break it up, you don't have these, these various nulls going on all throughout the room because it's, it's uh, well, you, you do have some, but not quite, not near as many. And if you're a professional a mastering or mixing engineer, it will break it up to enough that 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 null that you, is usually heard at the mix position from that be, due to the flat back wall reflection is like minimized or gone. So that's a marvelous thing. In a room, when you're playing speakers, you're going to have a resonance happening from front to back. It's going to slosh back and forth. I mean, take 50 hertz. Even if you have a decay of 0.4 seconds, how many times? Will, will 50 hertz bounce back and forth through that room in 0.4 seconds? It's quite a few. There's quite a few before it can be attenuated enough by the treatment you put in, see? So if you break it up in the, on, on that back wall bounce, it breaks up every time it hits. That's really assisting a lot. Um, and oh, oh, we get, I, let me get into this one thing where people talk about a uh, hundred percent absorption, you know, one absorption coefficient one equals a hundred percent. Sorry, that's bullshit. Okay, 
don't. Do you really want to go there? John? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I gotta. I gotta. Because I gotta. Ron, I, I saw you uh, holding your head when he said that. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, Ron and John, uh, there was an interesting uh, uh, discussion also on a forum, uh, on a, a Facebook forum, which I uh, came across the same uh, topic about uh, absorption coefficient of one. And I think uh, it's a good time to take this topic up and uh, thrash it down. Um, uh, completely. It's, it's, it's yeah. simple, as as Ron's explained before. It's a coefficient. It's a coefficient. You take that, and multiply it times the the area, and you get a saving, and that's the that's the amount of absorption that that gives. But you're never going to get more than about ten <laughs> decibels per surface okay. contact. Okay. I, I I'm you sorry, might. guys. I, uh, John, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to jump in here. Okay. I really yes, got please. to. Please. Okay. Uh, I know this is your part of it. I, I want to stay out of it as much as I can, but I got no, I want you. I want okay. you to. Because th this is, uh, we were having discussion with a couple of people about this. And, and number one, you have to understand, the coefficient was invented by Paul Sabin, not Wallace Sabin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wallace is the guy who discovered absorption officially. Okay. Paul is his nephew. You mentioned Paul, last time. Uh, I don't know. You yeah, mentioned last time. Yeah. Right. He's the guy who founded Riverbank Labs. And when right. he presented this at the ASA meeting in 1927, uh, one of his compatriots basically said he was an idiot. <laughs> and, and the reason he said he was an idiot was because he deliberately made this as a coefficient. A coefficient is a mathematical construct. It basically right. says all, sound, all the answers will call, fall between zero and one. Well, right. that fell apart immediately in 1927 on the first material they tested. And it was, it was fiberglass, about six inches thick, and they had a coefficient that came back at 1.05. So it was kind of like, how can this happen if it's a coefficient? It can happen because the mathematical construct is incorrect. Right. Okay. You got to understand, we're only talking three terms here. We're talking about the total amount of savings. We're yeah, talking yeah. about the total area. And mm -hmm. then it ends up, you divide one by the other, and you end up with the absorption coefficient, okay? Right. And if you end up with something above one, that means that the bottom sector, the, the, the divider, is incorrect. Right. If, if, if it were correct, it would be under one. Right. So, so the assumption is, what's wrong with the bottom part? And that's where the thing is falling apart every single time, because that's where we get into this edge effect function. Oh, so yeah. basically... Yeah, and, and so the idea here is what else affects the absorption? Not only the area, but the edges, the shape of it. The, uh, there's all kinds of different things that affect it. And there was this concept that area will over, overpower all this. Well, in, all, in fact, what we find is things like the, the shape of it, the edge sizes, uh, the sharpness of the edges actually equals more than the area. Ooh. Okay. Yes. So but, this, is, uh, this is Ron. Uh, no, would I? Would we be right in saying that when you say more than the area, more than the projected surface area, would that be the right uh, terminology? So yeah, if you're it, if yeah. if you're saying you're talking about the sound wave hitting that surface, the the perpendicular area which is exposed, uh, we can call it the projected area, and so that area is probably uh, less compared to what is, is actually to be considered. Is that the right? Uh... Yeah, what we found here in the original original papers I did in 2009, we found that if you measure one area and use the same area in a different a different configuration, you can have completely different answers. Yes. Okay, and that's because what happens is there is a physical area, and then yes. as we discovered later on uh, over the years, in fact, we get ready to present this in some papers here this year. You have a physical area, and then you have an area which is chosen for the mathematical formula. Yes, and and, yes. and it, it is it is a projected area. Yes, okay. and both are both both are different actually. Like we don't have yes. we don't have we don't have a, a real uh, we don't have a real formula which is accurate in that sense. Well, no, actually, that's part of what our new papers are about. We do have a formula now. Okay, right. so so and it's, it's, and it's, it's still work it's still work in progress as you say as you speak. Yeah, it's it's wavelength based, so okay. each frequency okay. has a different area that shows up. Got it. Got okay, it. Got and, it. Got and it. We, we now know how to calculate that. We know how to do that. 
uh, as part of today's concern, I'm going to show you some graphs to show you that we've pretty much got a hands on it now. Uh, Ron, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt once again. So uh, are you essentially considering some kind of an integ integral function which uh, summarizes uh, the, the various yes. wavelengths? Uh, okay, yeah, so I, exactly I got it. I got I got the I got the gist. Fair enough. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you do because I'm not a I'm not a calculus person. Okay, I no, I, uh, I, 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 never it, I, so yeah, I I got I got the I got the gist. Please go yeah, ahead. I'll please. show. I'll, yeah, I'll show you the formula here shortly. You can look, look at it. It works awesome. very very nicely. Okay, but it does count. It does assume some things. But I, the facts are, know. yeah, the facts are that what we discovered is that is that you have to look at a whole bunch of stuff besides. And and uh, so therefore the coefficient really should not be a coefficient because so, as soon as you say uh, I'm, I'm sorry so if you have a coefficient and your coefficient calculation comes out to 1.2 most of the programs like ease and catacoustic and odeon always cut it back to 0.999 right right okay so if you if you if you take the amount of total absorption Divide it by the area, and you come up with 1.05 or 1.5 or whatever, and then you go back the other way. And if you restrict it to 0.99, you will never mm -hmm. get back to the original amount of absorption. Got that's it. mathematical. That's a mathematical problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. It just, so you know, essentially, uh, so essentially, Ron, uh, what if I have understood it correctly? Uh, you are basically uh, not restricting to calling the the term as a coefficient, and you're uh, you're changing the basis of the mathematical formula that we are uh, uh, we are trying to construct, and uh, you are trying to uh, devise a kind of a new kind of a formula to calculate what absorption is. Is that uh, correct? In, yeah. In some. Way? Yeah. It, uh, basically, the coefficient. Isn't the coefficient? It what it yes, is? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a constant. It's a constant. It's all vary from from case to case. It would vary yeah. depending on the on the material and depending on the shape of the uh, the the absorption and, and right. things like that. Okay, yeah. So sorry. so so basically, by doing it a constant, you can have any number. Where right. in a coefficient, you're restricting what numbers you have. Correct. Correct. And no, it's uh, so, essentially, so essentially, what's happening is that the the current uh, the the current softwares that we have are trying to uh, restrict the value to within one. So there That's is right. a, in, there is an inherent error in the calculation uh, given by those uh, software softwares. That's exactly it. That's what we've been thinking for a hundred years. Go on. Okay. So when we, when we when we when we figured out what was going on, you know, we got attacked for uh, for attacking uh, Wallace Sabin, and we're sitting there <laughs> yes. going. We're not attacking Paul Sabin. We're we're just telling you that Paul Sabin was incorrect. That's all. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. but you'd be surprised how many enemies you can earn by, by doing that. <laughs> uh, that's you know, that's so. the that's the fundamental uh, way physics works. You you create uh, yeah whatever you call so called enemies, uh, but uh, that's the how uh, physics progresses uh, in reality. If you yeah, require well, some, to... yeah, one thing that happens is people don't realize that physics doesn't give a fart what you think. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so it's one of these things where we've been having to deal with it, and like I say, uh, during this meeting, we'll go over some of these things to show you what's going awesome. on because yes. it, it, there are better ways of doing it now, and uh, and it's starting to take effect in our in our business. But if you're overcoming a hundred years of knowledge, <laughs> it is very difficult to get people out there to understand these changes because they don't want to. True. Number There's one, because. It, yeah, they, they got they have learned something new and they don't want to do that. It's like it's already we're already past that point. <laughs> right. You know, so right. so I, I think the, the key behind here is what is it? So number one, coefficient uh or constant is an exponential number. Okay. Hmm. Okay. It's a log. <laughs> nice. Right, it's a log. It it's it, it changes in this case of uh of like an earthquake. When you go from 10, from 0 to 10, you go 10 times more. You go to 10, 0 to 20, you go to 100 times more, 10 times 10, and same way. When you go with percentages, that's a linear scale. Linear scales will never describe exponential functions. Never. Okay, so this is one reason why this 100% is, is, is extremely difficult to deal with because it was never intended to be 100% absorption. Uh, John had it right. If it was actually 100% absorption, if you had a, a, a one absorption material in a room, you would walk in the room and there'd be no sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anytime it's you can walk into a up. room. Yeah. I mean, even inside of an anechoic chamber, there's sound. Okay. And, and one of the arguments we were having on, on Facebook this today, 
happened yesterday, a day before, day before that, <laughs> was, was, you know, uh, anechoic chambers have an absorption coefficient of one. Therefore, they absorb all the sound inside the chamber. And looking at it going, Does it work that uh, way? Interesting. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, <laughs> interesting <laughs> concept. We've never experienced yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna make we're gonna make sound go away, and I'm looking at it going. You do know that anechoic doesn't make sound go away. All it does is it stops reflections. That's all it's intended to do, and that's done not by the material of the wedges, but by the shape of the wedges. Uh, so, okay, it, uh, Ron, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ron, I, I would like you, I would like you to direct I would like to direct your attention to the last uh, comment on the chat window. If you can maybe just address that point. So uh, Fennel basically makes a point of direct sound versus reflected sound. So, and he says no. that even if no. I, yeah. Yeah, that no. A hundred percent everything. Yeah, right. It, 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 direct sound is, is, is nothing that is not reflected sound. It's still sound. Exactly, exactly. Okay, there's no difference between them, okay? And that, that has nothing to do with it. In this situation, 100% absorption would absorb all the sound, including the direct sound. That's just mm -hmm. that's just how it functions. But that's not what this stuff does. And the way we know this is because in our measuring of our diffusion, one of the processes we do is we direct some sound from a source to the reflector or to the diffuser. And in order to know what is happening at the surface of the diffuser, okay, we put a uh, we put a flat surface there. And then we put a microphone right on the flash surface with a uh, ground uh, plane function. And we measure the level of the sound, the magnitude. We measure the frequency response and the phase response at that point. So right. we know what the sound is impinging upon that surface. Right. Now, let's drop a piece of absorption in there instead. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know what the impinging is, and we can measure the first order reflection coming off of it. At all these different angles, okay. In that in that distance of, in our case, four meters, there's two things of absorption. There is the absorption of the material itself, and there is the absorption of the air between the surface and the microphone. We can take out the air absorption by knowing what the air absorption is. That's calculatable. We know what that is for each frequency, so we can take that out. What's left is the loss of, it, of the attenuation of sound from this from the material itself. And, and, and what we can do is take the original measurement we did, the flat surface measurement, and we can normalize it. Now, I don't know how many people in here understand what the word normalized is. But what normalized is, is we take an inverse of the frequency response, magnitude response, and phase response, and we put it in till we end up with zero. So at all the frequencies, we end up with zero level, zero phase, et cetera. Okay, and we start at that point saying, at the, at the top surface of this absorber, we now have zero. So any reflections that come off that surface are measured in the way of attenuation because we know it cannot equal the level at that surface. It's just it's a physical impossibility to come off. Of it, okay, so we know that. So anything that comes off, we have a negative power. So now we can describe a, a directivity balloon that describes each angle and how much loss there is. Okay, and we know in this situation, if you have a, a an absorptive coefficient or absorptive material that is quote one, we can measure what the attenuation is off that surface to any space in space based upon the attenuation losses. And what we know is that the the amount of attenuation coming off a material that has a one is about ten dB. We've measured it over and over and over and over again. And I'm sorry, people, it may not make your idea of what 100% absorption is or anything else, but it's a fact. It's measurable. We can actually go through and say, here's how much attenuation there is off the surface. It's 10 dB of attenuation. It never exceeds that, no matter whether you would do 12 inches thick, 16 inches thick, 8 inches thick, or whatever. As long as the, the coefficient, quote, is above 1 or 1, that is the maximum you're going to get ever. So and that means that every time you have a surface that's one and you hit it with a sound, it's going to attenuate it by 10 dB. Okay. And that's it. That's all it's going to do. So now 
it's, it's, some of that sound will get through the surface to the hard surface behind it, reflect back out through, mm -hmm. and continue on to the next surface, and do another 10 dB. And you'll do that over and over until you lose sound. But that's not how anechoic chambers work. You know, that's what a quiet room is like, but that's not an anechoic chamber. An anechoic chamber has to have wedges that the the two angles, okay, uh, look, look, look at look at your surface that you're looking at, a flat surface. And do a, Ron, do a I'm going to share my screen. And okay. I've, got, I've got the AutoCAD up here. I'm going to share screen good, while good. you talk. There, if, there we go. Okay. Can, yeah, that's good. We can pin this, maybe I, I can uh, go ahead and talk. Yeah, I'm going I'm going to uh, put it on my view here as a speaker only. And now you can see these angles over the whole screen. Okay. And what's happening here is the uh, if you tap, go to, go to the back back here where the square is. Okay. And then take a vertical line. And, and by the way, you're moving your line around. So just line it up with one of the points, John. Okay. Here, I can just put a, a line there here. There you go. Okay, so, so that line. line, right, that's the line now at that point in time that is perpendicular to this to the surface we're reflecting off of. Okay, mm -hmm. the total the total angle of this tran of this triangle on either side of the line is this is yeah. fifteen degrees left and right, so it's a total of thirty. Yeah, 30, 30 degrees. So the point is, it doesn't really matter as long as that total angle does not exceed ninety degrees. Great. Sixty. Great. Okay, 60, so right. if you yeah, so if you have, uh, in this case, it's 30 degrees uh, here, uh, it doesn't matter. It's, it, the, two ang the two triangles together right here, okay, the tip, equal less than 90 degrees. Therefore, if you use Snell's law and the sound comes in uh, on, a, on a straight, like you got one of these lines here and you hit the side wall, uh, you got, uh, John, there you go, right there. All put right. that line in there. Do, okay. I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to put a line in. Just start right here and just go straight up. Okay, so yeah. this line comes out. Right. So if you measure if you measure the angle between the tip and the angle coming in, that is the angle of instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. That means that what a reflection comes off will come off equal the other direction. So if you take that angle and you come out the other way, like that way, okay, it will come off at 10 degrees or whatever that angle is. Okay, 15 degrees in this situation. So it goes off. And look at where it goes. It goes back into the other uh, wedge. So essentially the sound is the sound is trapped within the wedge itself. That's exactly oh, yeah. it. So what yeah. happens is every every angle on uh, because of the angle of uh, under 90 degrees, the sound will always reflect back into the wedges, into, in, into the base of the wedges. And so it it's, will it's, a, it, it's a it's a trap. It's it's a, in a way it's a trap. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And, and the sound will just rattle around until it disappears by air absorption. Right. Okay. And and that's how it happens. Nothing comes out of it. Now, people right. say, well, you can't have a reverberant field in an anechoic chamber. That's not right. true. You can, have, you can have a field of sound, but it, it has no reflections. And that's what the right. idea here is. So, right. and, and, and the idea is you're trying to reproduce a free field where if you take sound, it would decay by the inverse square. That's what you're trying to duplicate. If you have any kind of reflections, those reflections will cause a, a difference to that. Uh, and that's that's why we always tell people, you can have anechoic chambers that are not uh, anechoic wedges, like, uh, well, not not uh, fiberglass wedges. Because people say, well, you have to, you have, to have the absorption of, of what? That is, that, that's not true. <laughs> We have we have wedges like this made out of stainless steel, right? And and they're used underwater for sonar work, right? You know, if you put fiberglass underwater, I'm sorry, it'll soak up water and it won't work very well. Okay, but <laughs> so so the idea is, how do you prevent the reflections from coming out? It has nothing to do with the material that you're made of. What it has to do with geometry, the geometry, yeah, the geometry, the geometry only, yeah, yeah. Geometry. So, shape. so that so that's what we're talking about when we talk about absorption of the situation so so you, you uh, have... Ron, uh, one more thing so uh, one more point so uh, i would like to draw your attention to the last one more the, the last comment uh, so uh, fennel goes on to say that the angle of incidence is important when calculating absorption so uh, in in line with what you are saying right now with regards to the new formulation that you're coming up with uh, would it really matter? Because I think uh, you would be considering some kind of integral function. See, uh, uh, when we talk about absorption, obviously we are talking about uh, 
uh, I would believe a broadband absorption or very narrow band because uh, uh, like if doesn't you're talking about a broad, doesn't matter, right? No. So uh, no, if, is there any, so, yeah. Yeah, let, let me kind of get to where you're going to because for 100 years now, people have been looking at this edge effect thing and trying to marry random uh, incidence absorption to normal incidence absorption in a, in a, a, a impedance tube. Mm -hmm. So an impedance tube, you have sound that is normal to the, to the surface going and rattling around inside and decay, okay? Mm -hmm. And then in a reverb room like ours, we have sound coming from every angle, okay? And, right. and doing. You can never marry the two together. Yes. That has been proven 120 years now of research. It can't be done. They're completely different because in one area, you're only looking at the absorption of one angle of incidence. And, and yes. the panel's right in this respect. Angle of incidence is important. Okay. The question is, is it important? In, yeah. And, and, and the question is, is it important in an overall field? Yes. It's a field. If you want to, yeah. If you want to know all the details, yes, it's important. But when you're looking inside of a room, you have random incidents of sound. Yes. Okay. And therefore, you have to same. integrate yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. The it's the same thing as trying to compare a reverberation room measurement and an impedance tube measurement. It, you just yeah. can't marry them. This is yeah. what this is what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and that's the key here. Is angle of incidence is important if you want to know that, and it's a nice thing to know scientifically. But when you get into a room, it all goes away. Yes. Okay. So that's why the that's why random incidence is a, is a much better way of doing this. Because now you, you you like you say we have to uh, put integral. all these together. You, you got an integral for all the different angles. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and that's why that's that's much more important. It's so. it's definitely more scientific. It's definitely capturing all the random uh, stochastic uh, uh, like uh, yeah waves that you have. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this also occurs to our measurements of diffusion as well. Yes. Okay. There, even though you can measure it, it doesn't mean that the results are usable. Right. And, and that's something I want to make very, very clear is because if the energy coming off a surface is so small compared to the energy in the room, then it doesn't make any difference. It may be there. You may be able to measure it from a scientific point of view. But the question is, does it affect what you're listening to? And that's no. So when so, we talk about uh, mm. angle of incidence for like diffusion, mm. when we measure, we've discovered that if you measure with the source between zero and 15 degrees, of, right. of, uh, of the uh, perpendicular, then that uh, gives you a level that is that is uh, adequate to be heard. Right. When you when you reach things like forty five degree incidents or eighty degree grazing incidents and stuff, the energy coming off surfaces are so small mm. that they're forty and fifty dB down. Right. Okay. Right. Can we measure it? Sure. Sure. Can, is, it. can you hear yeah, it? Can, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the key. Can you hear it? You know, so we have the same thing with absorption as well. You know, so Ron, you have to. Uh, yeah, I get, I get it. As a follow-up question, uh, uh, so uh, we were talking about uh, the usage of an integral function. So would it be a double integral wherein you're, cal uh, where you're on one side, you're taking the frequency uh, band and on one side, the angle of incidence. So let's say you have a double integral. Is it is yes. it a double integral? Yes. Okay, I got yeah. it right. Good. <laughs> I, think, I think I think I'm on the right track. Uh, so I think uh, with that said, uh, I would also like to direct your attention to one more question, which uh, Fennel again asks. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, how much weightage or importance would you give to the FSI? FSI uh, is a frequency uh, yeah, uh, index uh, or basically spacing index while designing, and uh, uh, you... that that actually. Uh is part of what our paper is exactly, this formula exactly. is spent it spent the last two years now right. we figured out how to do it for a single monolithic piece of uh, material right so you can describe a circular or a square or a rectangle and we can tell you what the absorption is of that uh and it took us a year to figure that out year and a half okay but then we found out that when you actually measure things and you break them up into pieces that uh, you can space them apart and as long as the space is equal to or less than the size of the sample, you have an effect as well. Right. So you increase the absorption based upon square. So if you have a two foot square sample and you space it uh, anywhere from zero to two feet apart in all directions, you will increase the absorption, even though that you don't increase the, uh, the uh, area of it. But 
as soon as you reach two foot, that effect goes away. Right. Okay. So we had it, to come it up with a It doesn't all disappear. Am I correct in saying it doesn't all disappear? It just lessens and lessens. You, you no. have this. No, uh, it, it disappears, disappears completely. completely. It, yes, it 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 it's it, very it, maxima it, it maximizes and that's it. It never gets any more. Oh, it so doesn't it get any more. To it, yeah, right. exactly. That's what I mean. It's it's there yeah. around the the pieces, but it's not in the empty space that you've separated past that point. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the empty space can never equal more than the size of the sample. Ever. Right, right, right. Yes. Okay. So that's another integral that has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, one, Ron, one more question. So essentially what uh, you guys are trying to do is you are trying to move away from the, the ray tracing model and get into a more, a kind of a uh, FEA or let's say a, 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 fine, a, a fluid structure interaction kind of a model. Is that right? Well, it's both really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Ron's doing ongoing research and this is like, you know, we're studying this and we're, we're, we're we're trying to so, match uh, up we, the 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 point of reality with yeah yeah the math I get you know that. true yeah so, yeah look the facts are uh, sci uh, sound has always been a fluid thing right. it's it, we, right. we always talk if we want to compare things in physics you compare sound to fluid dynamics yes you know and that's the thing most people don't understand is it's fluid yes. dynamics yes. And, and if you don't meet the same criteria as fluid dynamics, then you're going to end up with the wrong answers. And, and part of this has to do with what they call scattering. Right. Scattering was decided as being a, a, a way of, of, of compensating for not knowing what absorption is. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. And, and, and it was a situation where um, nobody knew exactly how to calculate real absorption. So when you look into all these programs, they would always under calculate the absorption of a real, always. Right. So how do we fix that? We invented something called scattering. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how it's used in, in, in the programs, uh, you'll find that the, uh, the the function is exactly the same as the absorption coefficient, except mm -hmm. that they've added a, a, a quote, Lambert scattering effect, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, which is supposed to be an explanation of why you lose that much energy, which mm. is, I'm sorry, mm. it's, it's a bunch of BS, okay? <laughs> Just that simple. <laughs> so so basically mm. what scattering is now is is the edge effect. That is the edge effect. So right. if you measure the edge effect correctly, you don't need scattering anymore. Now you have the true absorption. And and now we've, we've figured out how to do that. We actually found that the models actually match up very closely with the real life. Right, you know, so that's been the whole idea behind here. So, uh, so yeah, we, we need to look at, the, at at sound as a three dimensional thing. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things, that, uh, especially in our design work, uh, and John knows this now, is that it's not so much diffusion as much as phase change that affects what we hear. Right. right. And that's not that's not really something you can measure physically where you can put out something out there and say, well, because of the change of the attenuation balloon, we hear differently. Right. We, we right. hear differently because we can change the phase. And you have two different ears and two different ears, the phase arrives at different times in your ears. And, yes. and, and the people who are involved in bioacoustics will tell you that the brain interprets that as space. Right. So the, the more variation you have in a phase between the two ears, the more spacious the room will sound. And, and, right. and, people, and people in bioacoustics have known this for years. Our problem is that people in acoustics have never thought about this because guess what? The rest of physics doesn't exist for us. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, as soon as we start discovering that the rest of physics has an effect on what we do, then we have to start to think, oh, wow, acoustics is much more complicated than we thought it was. <laughs> you know, so it, all of a sudden it becomes, uh, you know, the, the domain of people that are scientists rather than just practitioners. So, and, uh, Ron, and, uh, Ron, are you, are you, uh, are you solving some kind of uh, Navier-Stokes equations in, 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 the sen in that sense, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, CFD domain, the, the fluid dynamics domain? Yes, we are. Uh, that's that's part awesome. of what we're doing here. Yeah, awesome. we're we're trying to apply fluid dynamics to this thing 
so that it actually figures out what's going on. And, 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 and in doing our research, we've discovered that there is a fourth domain of absorption, which nobody ever had discovered previously. Okay. okay. You have absorption that's frictional, mm -hmm. which is described by having fiberglass in the wall or whatever, and the sound goes through the fiberglass and it goes around all the little threads of the fiberglass and in doing changing uh, direction, it loses something like this, Something like this. The, the fibers, this is fibers. Yeah. The fibers. Yeah. So the sound goes through it. And in going through it, it slows down. Right. It has changed direction. It has to slow down. Sound doesn't just go through like laser. Okay. Right. It's slowing right. down. It changes to heat. Dissipation, and uh, heat dissipation. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is absorption, by the way, just so you understand. Yes. If you take it all down to the last little thing, yes. absorption is a conversion of energy to heat. That's it. Yes. It's all this. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you have frictional absorption there. Then the secondary absorption you have is diaphragmatic absorption. And people think that moving these 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 surfaces in and out like this uh, is absorbing the sound because it's acting like a uh, like a shock absorber. That is not true. You're only moving the diaphragm. That's all you're doing. What's happening is if you look at the edge of a diaphragm where it's it's solidified to something hard, you're bending it. So this is like taking a piece of metal and bending it back and forth like this. It gets hot. Okay. And, and it gets hot right there where the joint is. So that's what's happening on these diaphragmatic absorbers is they're, they're edge controlled and they move in and out. So the edge right around the edge gets hot from the bending action. And that's mm -hmm. a conversion of energy into heat. Therefore, it's absorptive. Hmm. Now, well, the third way. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Would, oh, would, would then, instead of using um, um, uh, fibrous materials like polyfill and glass wool, wouldn't steel wools or uh, metal wools be better at this conversion of energy to heat? And no. The heat of frictional is it doesn't care what the material is. It really does not. Yes. Uh, it, it is just a matter of how many times can you make the sound change direction internally. Uh, if I can, if I can just add one more point uh, to what uh, Mazban mentioned. Uh, so there is also something known as microscopic absorption, which is something that uh, yeah. physically, yeah. So that's something that you require a highly fibrous material for that uh, to really function. So yeah, yeah. centered carbon, centered yeah. steel. I mean, right. there's a million different ways of describing this stuff. Uh, right. If you look at open cells uh, foam. Yes, same open, thing, open, idea. open board. Yeah, right. so I mean, the whole idea here is to change the direction of sound. That's all you're trying yes. to do. Yes. Okay, yes. so now we've covered both diaphragm and, and frictional. There's a third, and that is resonance. Resonance-based, yeah. So if you have a, a, a tube and you have air trapped in it and you activate one end of it, it'll go back and forth inside of the tube. And every time it goes to one end, it's closed, it'll compress the air and it'll decompress on the way out and recompress the other end. Goes back and forth like a shock absorber. Yeah. And every time you, as, as, as soon as you, as soon as you put together the air and you compress it, in compressing it, you make the molecules go together. They become more solid and they re, and they, uh, oh, what's the word I'm thinking about here? Um, heat of compression? Yeah, it, it's when you compress the air, you convert to heat. Because in this situation, you have all these molecules get pushed together. They don't like that. That's boring. okay. So they so they resist. You have air resistance, and the resistance uh, slows down the sound wave. And so when it slows Ron, it down, you're talking about the you're, you're talking about the basic concept of a Helmholtz uh, resonator. Yeah, uh, or a, a a shock absorber. Yeah, just plain shock absorber. So right. you slow down you slow down the speed of sound in doing right. so. You convert it to heat. Yeah. Or a Schroeder okay. diffuser with wells. Well, let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that later. We'll right? we, yeah, we'll we don't want to get there yet. <laughs> That's opening okay. a can of worms. Yeah. yeah so, I, so th those, I, those I tend to do that. Yeah. Those are the three methods of absorption that we have used for 100 years now. Right. But in our research, because of the edge effect, we've also discovered a fourth form of absorption. That's called diffraction. Hmm. And, and this, this occurred back in 1960 at Ohio State University when they were discovering uh, what happens with radar waves going over and changing direction over an over a, a edge. So they had wedges that were like so, and the radar was going like this. And, and what happened was it would change direction. 
And in doing so, the edge of the of the wedge would turn red hot. Yeah, it would, it would heat up and turn red hot. So somebody said, well, it's because they're metal wedges. Because the radar waves we're talking. By the way, in order to be able to measure this, we had to have a source that was 35 megawatts. <laughs> okay. Oh. So so that's that, that's why I'm saying you have to understand that it's a matter of of, of uh, scale here. Didn't so we had 30 Drummond minutes. use that during the development of the stealth fighter? Similar? Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's exactly absolutely. It. That's how it works. So, that's how so, it all works. Uh, that's yeah, all absolutely. Sure. Yeah, yeah. All your all your fighter jets, which are there, so they are basically having, uh, 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 they are immune to the radar. So they are radar cross-section. There's a term in, uh, in defense which is called RCS, the radar, radar cross-section. And uh, yeah, uh, Ron would know that uh, better yeah. than most. So, so the radar, radar cross section is something that, yeah, yeah radar, radar cross section is extremely small, extremely yeah, small. Uh, well, I'll give you an idea. Uh, uh, the radar cross section of a F-16 fighter is it's roughly a, around two, about two meters, I think it is, yeah. F-16. Yeah, it's okay. probably even smaller than that. It's even smaller than yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, now an F-22 has a radar cross section of somewhere mm -hmm. around a, a third of a, a square inch. Yes, oh, smaller than it's it. so small. Smaller, yeah, smaller it than the spotted, it, it can't be spotted by like for all practical mm -hmm. purposes. It's it's uh, it's uh, immune to a radar. Yeah, yeah. So it's about the size of a bumblebee, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and, uh, so that that's how it works, and it's and we also have uh, absorption materials on it too. Yes, uh, the radar it's absorption made, materials. Yes. Right, and, and that that's highly secret, and that's yeah, why yeah. nobody knows this stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so back to our our situation with the diffraction. So we know that when it goes over, so what we did is we changed the wedges from metal to wood. And when we did the same thing, the edge of the, of the, of the thing burst into flame. Oh, wow. And it was like, well, I guess it has nothing to do with metal. <laughs> okay. It burst into flame. So somebody said, well, let's try it with fiberglass. So we did it with fiberglass too. And the mm -hmm. edge melted. Mm -hmm. So the, the next concept is if it has nothing to do with metal, what's happening? Well, what was happening is every time you bend the radar wave, the action of, of bending and changes the phase. If you change the phase, you have a loss of heat along that edge in the air. And if you have heat conversion, what do you have? Absorption. Okay. So, so what we discovered is by the act of changing the direction of the sound, you have the absorptive function along that edge. Now, in sound, it's very small. You can barely, you can't even measure it hardly at all. But when you put it together with a whole bunch of edges, now it becomes significant. Okay. Right. And this is this is why when we measure absorption, the you want to have the smallest ratio of edge length to area that you can get. Hmm. So, what is the small, what is the smallest circumference available around a, an area? The perimeter. The perimeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What is the perimeter? What What is the length of the perimeter? What is the shortest one you can have around an area that surrounds an area? Back okay. mat. A circle. That's the mi okay. minimum you can have. Correct. 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 That's right. Okay. So, okay. So, if you measure a circle, it will give you a certain amount of absorption. You calculate it using the method, and if you take that same area and convert it to a square you'll get a different measurement. And what was what this came about because of the measuring process of scattering, where you have a circle sample. Mm -hmm. So we measured the absorption, and then we took the same area and made it into a square, and the mm -hmm. square gave us about a 20% higher absorption. Right. And we're going, right. okay, that's not supposed to happen because it's supposed right. to be you know, area divided by or absorption, which is exactly the same, okay, mm -hmm. uh, divided by a thing. So we said, well, what happens if we change it to a, say, a four by three rate, uh, ratio, mm -hmm. uh, like a rectangle? Mm -hmm. And it went up another 10%. Okay. And then we went to uh, an eight by two sample, and it went up another 15%. And then we broke it up into two by two pieces and put it on the floor and just scattered them around the floor. So we had the maximum amount of perimeter to area available right and in doing so we increase the absorption coefficient at 1k in this particular material which is one inch fiberglass from 0.88 to 1.7 wow wow oh yeah that's what i say <laughs> the wow. amount was like almost double wow. and somebody said well that's impossible well okay so how do we prove that the edges are effective well this is simple you take away the material. 
Right, right. And leave, and leave <laughs> the edges. Now, how do you do okay. that? Uh, you know, it's like we, we make edges in, in imagination and put them out in space and measure them. Yeah. No. Okay. Right. But you, what you can do is make a two-by-two two sample made out of steel. Right, right. Okay. Now you take these two by two samples, the same amount you stack, have. To the stack them up, stack them up. No, no. Well, no. you don't stack it, just scatter it around the floor. It's like the other stuff, yeah. right? Right. And you measure it. Do you get any right. absorption? Okay. Right. You know darn well the material is not going to give you absorption. So right. anything you measure has to be tied directly to the edges. And we measured hmm. it. And the average coefficient of absorption of steel scattered around the floor was 0. 0.2. Huh. Okay, now think about that for a second. You can now make an absorber to go on the wall made out of steel. Put it on the wall, and it will still give you an absorption of 0.2 mm. at all the frequencies. Mm. Now, this is like, ooh, we can get absorption doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this, when we presented this, you want to talk about controversial? Mm. Oh right. my God, you couldn't believe that people that, that scream bloody murder. It's like you can't have absorption, <laughs> but you have no material. Well, right. well you want to argue with the, the, the measurements? Uh, you know, the guys that were there for the measurements were people who were very well known in the industry. Uh, Ken mm -hmm. Roy from Armstrong, a number of other people like him. They were there as part of it. And they all said the same thing if we had not been here physically to watch all this, we wouldn't believe this. Right. So, so uh, if I have to summarize what you're saying, Ron, uh, just for the benefit of everyone, uh, the moment you introduce an edge, uh, you would have some amount of absorption inherently, irrespective of the material that you're using. Yes. So now let's talk about why that's the case. Right. Okay. If you have a point in space, right, and you have a ray hitting it, and it changes direction, it will right. change direction in any of 360 degrees. Omnidirectional, omnidirectional. Yeah, completely omnidirectional, right? So right. that is that is a change in, in energy for that ray. Right. Now, if you take that, that point and extend it in one direction, you now have right. an edge. Right. Okay. Right. So now the energy is coming in along that edge. And the yes. way physics works is you can come in at any angle on that edge. But coming mm -hmm. off that edge, it will always be normal to the edge. Yes. So if you have the edge going X, Y, or I mean X, X, plus x minus x, the sound will always come off in the plus y minus y direction. Yes, yes. Okay, 90 degrees. Yes. So now, now what happens is all these points all occur from different directions coming in, but they all come off. And what happens right. is when they come off, they are all equal phase. Mm. Because if they're all the same direction, they will have the mm. same phase. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now you take this edge and extend it in, another, in the Z direction. You now have a face that is vertical. And you have the edges, and we come in on an angle, any angle, right? It comes mm -hmm. off normal to the edge at first, and half of the angle of whatever the other face is. Mm. So if you have a 90 degree face, it comes off at 45 degrees. Right. Okay. Again, they're all the same direction. Therefore, they're all in the same phase. Same and therefore, right. And, and that, and that, another word for that, and you're saying phase is coherent. Coherent, right? Okay. If it's coherent, it's also additive. Sorry, uh, what's the term uh, that you? All, all the all the energy, yeah, all the energy that's coming off in the same direction as coherent is also additive. Right, additive. So, yes, it's right, it's like uh, vectors align in the same some, direction. There's some. There's some. Yeah, vector. Well, really... at, at, actually, what you guys are talking about is it's the same as a laser. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So that's why lasers are so effective in energy is because they're all coherent energy. Directional, extremely directional. That's exactly it. And and and, and it's all additive. Therefore, you add heat that, that occurs from that. All that energy be focused right. at one spot. Right. Okay. It's the same way with sound, by the way. So right. so now if you have a straight edge, you'll always have coherent energy. If you have a circular edge, it comes off normal to the edge. But each point on that circle is a different angle. Yes. And therefore, if it comes off uh, normal to that edge, it will always come off following the edge of the curve. And therefore, there is a change in phase yes. at each yes. point. Yes. That means all the energy coming off a circle is non-coherent. Yes. And therefore, it's not additive. 
and therefore you don't get an additional amount. And that's why the circle gives you less absorption right. than any than any square edge item does. And therefore, right. now the question is, what shape should an absorber be? Well, the idea here is to make as many edges as possible. Right. So, so what is a what is a, a shape that has lots of edges? A so star good. shape. Well, a star shape. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. A star shape. Oh, star. I'm sorry, right. yeah, 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 yeah. It's the opposite of a circle. So, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Any kind I, of star I, I, shape. I yeah. 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 So lots and lots and lots of uh, things. So the idea mm -hmm. is to maximize the amount of uh, of the length of the straight edges to the mm -hmm. area. So that's that's what you do. So if you want to have maximum amount of uh, uh, energy in this situation, you want to make sure you maximize the length, the the ratio of the perimeter edge to the area. And that's how you maximize your energy. So in our situation, we figured that if you take a star shape, you can increase the absorption of an area by about the, three times. I think the best uh, shape, uh, there, there is a term in uh, physics or let's say mathematics, it's fractals. Basically, you're talking about a fractal shape. There you go. <laughs> there yeah. you go. You yeah. actually yeah. got it right there. And that's yeah. the whole point is, is, yeah. is this is going to force people mm. to start looking at absorbers in a three-dimensional way. Right. Okay. Right. So now you're going to have absorbers that have, you know, all these other edges around in, in a, in a XY type uh, domain, but now you're going to have to increase that in the Z domain as well. Right. Right. So now you're going to have these, right. these absorbers that look like, like, like a, a, a star. Right, uh, right. three-dimensional star in all directions, right. or a, a sea urchin, or sea urchin. <laughs> right. But urchin. one is yeah, there really. any limiting uh, limiting factor as to how close one edge should be from another, or how close it should not be? Yes, we talked about that earlier. The whatever the area is should never exceed the space in between. No, the space between should not but that, so, that's that that is the at the maximum point but what about minimum how close can edges be well they can be right next to each other <laughs> so then what if you had like a, a row of uh like baffles straight up like a, like a, a comb kind of arrangement in a comb that's it's what we've been testing we've just that's been what we've been testing <laughs> that oh. has been around for years okay uh, the, the first tests that were done in the 1920s were done that way Okay. okay. Uh, so you can look at all that. But basically what happens is the space in between can never exceed the size of the comb uh, teeth. Space so, in between. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a straightforward geometric uh, construct, I think. Uh, that's you can exactly just, it. Yeah. yeah. So, so if, you look, if, you, yeah, if you look at all the old the old data that's been around, you, uh, there was uh, what they call strip data. They would make mm -hmm. a piece of absorption that was uh, three inches wide by 16 feet long and they put another one right next to it three inches away and three inches away and three inches away and they would get huge amounts of absorption right you know so that that goes back to uh, the old uh, measurements uh, the old uh, research papers from the 1930s uh and you know and and that's but nobody ever bothered to pursue how to actually calculate that they just noticed that it showed a difference. That's all, it, and and then they went on trying to marry it with the the impedance tube measurements. So uh, it's not that this wasn't uh, explored many many years. It's just nobody ever bothered to pursue it to the point of using it. Right, but Rod, so, uh, so there's also the question that arises as to wavelengths, right? So I mean, uh, a, if you consider geometrical shapes, then I mean, are you then um, uh, tying down uh, uh, the ends are in in forms of frequency, like I mean, yes, yeah, of course, of yeah. course, of course, of course. And would yeah. they be limited by quarter wavelength uh, physics, or that, what? And, and and that that's what that spacing is. The spacing is dependent upon the wavelengths. So oh, right. essentially, yes. uh, Mars bun. If I have to, uh, like, uh, Aron, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, so essentially, uh, we we talked about something like a fractal uh, concept, yeah. a fractal geometry. So if you're talking about, let's say, a lower wavelength, you'll just have a larger size fractal uh, uh, as opposed to a smaller size fractal. Right. Yeah. Am I right? But the yeah. yeah. spacing yeah. also depends on the frequency. Right. The yeah, the thing. So <laughs> if you have like a, if you have like a, 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 a an equal spacing, you'll only absorb one frequency. Is what I'm trying to say. Is so if you have a well, large fractal, that that will take care of all the frequencies. Uh, about that. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. It, 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 yeah. What happens here is whatever size you start out with, you 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 limit the low frequency 
and That's everything great. above it is fine. Absolutely, everything above it works great. Works so, great. so, so, what you do is you decide where the lowest frequency is that you want to deal that with. Is. You that create the, the the unit that way, and then everything above that is is okay. But Ron, so let, let's take an example where I'm trying to absorb, say, eighty hertz or hundred hertz or something, and uh, I need to space them, say, three feet apart. And I've got um, uh, four feet panels, which are spaced three feet apart. Now at this spacing of three feet or two feet or whatever the space in between, if I have a 16 kilohertz wave, that's going to reflect off that spacing. It will not get absorbed by those absorbers at, at that particular point, right? Because there's no, no edge. No, that's not true. It depends on what the material is. If you have fibrous material, it's going to suck up 16K. No, no, at the... The, the material would, but when you've got the spacing, the spacing is it, a plain it, wall, it, right? That's going it, to be it, the it, reflector for 16 kilohertz, right? No, it's not in this situation because remember I told you, it becomes an apparent material. Ah. So it has the same characteristics as the material does. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, yeah. So that's that's why it gets really interesting. So, yeah, it, uh, it will absorb. Too. Yeah, it's, it, it has to do with the fact that it's an apparent material. Okay, so whatever the characteristics are of the material, it will carry over into space. Even if that material is plain concrete wall, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, it yeah. hides it. it it's, 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 like, it's like a ghost. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> and that's why it's scary because you have to start thinking now in, into, you know, what the uh, geometry is. So right. if you have, if you want 100 hertz, the first thing you have to do is figure out what size panel will see at you know, 100 hertz. Hmm. Okay. Well, if you think about that for a second, then you got uh, approximately one foot for one K. That means mm -hmm. two foot for 500 Hertz it means mm -hmm. four feet for 250. That means mm -hmm. eight foot for 125. Mm -hmm. So it'll be somewhere around 10 foot. Right. Right. This means right. If the panel is not at least 10 foot, right. it's not going to see 100 Hertz. Right. Okay. And, and this is why there's this been this misnomer for years. Uh, uh, about material thickness and how much space you have behind it. Hmm. Okay, so if you have a four inch material, people are saying, well, you can raise it up to four inches off the surface and increase low frequency absorption. That is untrue. That's the best way I can put it. Yeah. Okay, so, and here's why. It has to do with fluid dynamics again, okay? Yes. yes. <laughs> So if you have a, 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 a fiberglass panel that is uh, four inches thick, the sound will go through it and out the other side. Right. Right. Okay. Now, if you have a, a gap behind it, there is now an area or a volume that is pressurized by the waveform. Right. Okay. If the gap around the outside uh, edge is small enough to prevent all that air from moving fluidly through there, without any pressure, uh, back pressure, then it will not do anything. So as you as you decrease the space, you decrease the edges, the exposed edges, and therefore you have less volume being able to, to leave under the pressure. And therefore, if it can't leave, it'll build a pressure inside of it. It's apparent pressure again, as long as that edge is small enough to keep it at least partially contained. And well, you'll get some much yeah, so so it's got to be one inch or less. Anything over one inch, the the apparent uh, size of the of the gap is is large enough to allow the pressure to relieve to zero. Hmm. Therefore, there's no effect. Okay, so hmm. as long as you have an open edge, one inch is the limit, and we've right. shown this over and over in, in measurements. Now, if you take that edge and you close it off, like a like an E four hundred mount or or an E mount where you have an edge that goes all the way to the, to the surface and blocks that air in. Now that is a trapped air thing, like a resonance area. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have trapped air, you have a, an effect like a, like a shock absorber, and you mm -hmm. have increased low frequency absorption. If you have five or six inches or whatever, okay? Yeah, that's you're always two, trapped you're air. You're using two of the absorption techniques. You're using the right. fiber and the, pre and the, and the uh, pressure. Uh, piston. Pressure. Pistonic. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean that that's that's what you have to realize is is if you leave these things open, slow dynamics works. If you press water and you have a big right. enough uh, drain, the water goes right. away. Right. Okay? This is one of my one of my examples I use for teaching about reverberate rooms or reverberate mm -hmm. energy. 
is think of a room like a bathtub. Right. Okay. You have a one inch drain and I have a two inch source. <laughs> okay. Water comes in at mm -hmm. twice the volume that the drain will allow to go out, mm -hmm. but it's still a drain. So the question is, will the, will the bathtub fill up? Yeah. Yeah. If it's a two inch source and a one inch drain, the bathtub would fill up. At what point? At what point does the fill stop? It will not overflow. You honestly think it will overflow? Yes, it would. Okay. No, it won't. And here's why. Because as the volume of the water goes up in the bathtub, the pressure, pressure on the pressure drain is, okay, okay. and the it's pressure called compensates. Relief. It's called relief. It's called pressure relief. Okay. Yeah. So you know what I'm saying, <laughs> Curtis? Yeah, I, I know. At what some you're point, saying. at some point, the water will stabilize at some level in the in the in the right. bathtub, right? Right. Okay. That pressure, that that level, is the reverberant field in a room. Okay. These concepts so, are also used. Uh, these concepts are also used in hydraulics and pneumatics, basically in designing the <laughs> pressure re relief valves and uh, all those yeah. things. And, and these are also used in in aerospace for airplanes and all kinds yep. of things. So yep. see, it's funny how physics applies everywhere. <laughs> okay? Absolutely. So in this situation, I always ask people, well, why is it that you could take a uh, SPL meter and go out in the room and and say, isn't this great? How even the sound is in the room. Okay, they'll take an SPL meter out there and they'll go out beyond where the speakers are and say, yeah, see, it's, it's the same level everywhere. So this is a great absorption in this room. This room is well treated and everything else. And, and I will look at him and go, okay, think about the fact that you are a person laying down in this bathtub. Okay. Mm -hmm. And your, your nose is the probe. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you are above the water level, you are in the direct field of the speaker. Therefore, as you lower yourself, you go away from the source, you'll actually detect the difference in the pressure, okay, by breathing. Now, let's say you lower your nose to just below the surface of the water. I mean, we're like a quarter inch below the surface of the water. When you breathe, what are you breathing? Water. Breathing water. You're water, right? Okay. Uh, are you going to drown? Probably if you breathe in too much water. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, let's say you lower your nose one foot below the water. Are you going to breathe water? Yeah. Same. Are you going to Are you going to drown? Yeah. Same. Okay. Yeah. Therefore, the result is you have the same level of death. Same which level. Is of what you're, which is the measuring that you're doing. It's the same SPL. The result is the same. So no matter where you are under the water, you are equally dead. But rather than that, I think the the more the better analogy would be the effect on your eardrums as you go from with your nose just at the surface and go well, two feet and go ten feet. What's the pressure you, on your eardrum? Sure, but, but my my question to you is this: Do you care if you're dead? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the real point here is I'm just trying to demonstrate that when you get out beyond a critical distance, the sound level in a room will be the same no matter where you are because you're equally Absolutely. underwater. Okay. Absolutely. So when you have people out there with a Radio Shack sound level meter say, isn't this great how even all the sound is? I'm sitting there going, well, yeah, if you don't mind being yeah. dead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're in this. So it's, wrong, it's, a, it's a fundamentally wrong measurement. It's yeah. a fundamentally wrong measurement, and yeah. you get you get you get you get excited by a wrong measurement, and you say that okay, mm -hmm. I'm measuring the right thing. Right. Well, it, it, and you just brought up something, Kardec, that really bugs me all the time. People say, "Well, we did a measurement." I don't care if you did a measurement. If you did a wrong measurement, it doesn't care. If it's still a wrong measurement. Absolutely. Okay. You, Absolutely. Can, you can measure. You can measure anything. Doesn't mean you have a good measurement. Absolutely. You know? That's exactly so, the point. Yeah. So when people come back and they say to me, well, I put something in a room and I measured it and, and it took something out of the room. There's a difference. Well, that's nice, except for one small problem. You do, you know what was the, yeah, do, do you know what was in the room before you put the thing in? OK. And the other question is, if you're measuring it, do you also subtract the absorption of the air where the sound is traveling through? Right. Right. No, I just, I just measure the difference. I know what the difference is. So therefore, that's how much absorption it has. Well, no, you don't know what the air is absorbed between that source and your ear. So if you don't take that out, 
that means whatever you measure is not correct. And that's what all these standards are for, is to tell you how to do this. And that is, if you have a reverberant room, we measure this uh, level, uh, empty room, the full room, and then we take out all the air absorption in, in the thing. And because it's a diffused room, we know what that characteristic is. And we yeah. subtract all that. We take out all the other things because you make sure the room doesn't have an absorption coefficient of its own that is above 0.01. Okay, right. so that right, that's measure. critical. That that right, right so, there is, is extremely right. critical. And so why you, you measure in a room like why yeah, test these things? Yeah, this yeah. is why a room like Cardi I see in your background. You have all these things hanging on the wall. Okay, what is the absorption characteristics of all the the couch, the chairs, and everything else in your body? Okay, that's the yep. point. If you're out there measuring it, you can't measure it with your body because your body is absorbing. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. That's why you have to put a microphone in and walk out of the room, seal it up, make sure right. the air is not moving anymore. Yeah. Uh, you have to make sure there's diffuse field and stuff in order to be able to it, measure it. In fact, in fact, the, the very microphone itself would have its own geometry, which would add to the absorption. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, and you have to, you so have talking, to take that. You're talking about literally, you're, you're talking about literally a probably yeah. a, a, a omnidirectional small microphone, which is uh, the size of a <laughs> quarter inch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, people think that just putting the material in and measuring it compared to a room tells you what the absorption is. And all it tells you is what the end result is of, of doing something, but you don't know exactly what you did. Right. Okay. And that's, that's why we have these standards and we use rooms like reverb rooms, which are controlled uh, environments where we know what the absorption of that room is to the nth degree. Right. And now we can subtract that, that room out and then we can also take out all the air. And right. it's not just oxygen. We have to know what the, what the uh, losses of uh, energy are going through oxygen, nitrogen, right. carbon dioxide, right. and all that. Right. So we have... Right. We have a, we know how much there is at each frequency, how much loss there is per foot traveled of, right. of uh, sound going through air. And we have to back that all out. We have to back out all these other things, all these compensations. Uh, what is the compensation for a concrete floor uh, on a room? Uh, so, it has uh, a certain amount of absorption. Right. So, Ron, uh, you have raised a very important, uh, very interesting point. So, effectively, what we have been uh, like assuming uh, for time, uh, for many, many decades, is uh, a fundamentally a flawed kind of a concept. So, uh, uh, what is the, if I have to ask you, uh, I'm just trying to articulate this question. What, what is the extent of error that we have been assuming so far? Like, to what extent we have been off the target? Because, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, when when you say when you say that uh, you're getting coefficients, or let's say I won't use the word coefficients, I will I'll use the word constants, like uh, as opposed to what we assume as point, let's say eight, you're getting one point seven. So it, that's like way it's off more target. than double. It's like yeah. I mean, it's really hard. So, it's wrong. Yeah. I I did a paper. Uh, you can go to my website. You can download it in in San Francisco on how to measure uh, a unknown piece of material okay mm. and in there we uh we took the material measured the standard way came up with a set of absorption coefficients okay uh, numbers constants uh we also uh did the measurement where you split things up so we could calculate what the what the perimeter edge, ratio edge absorption is right we calculated that and then we put in a piece of a material that had a shape that i had no idea what it was uh, the guys did it for me. We measured it, and then they then told me what the shape was so I could calculate what it should be. And the calculation uh, was somewhere in between the two, okay, uh, which tells us we still didn't have all of the, the space. That's why we we didn't know anything about spacing at that point in time. Uh, so I, I published those papers. And if you'll go in there, you'll see at certain frequencies. And, and by the way, this, this effect only occurs at certain frequencies. So if you have one inch material, you get the maximum effect at around 1200 Hertz. Mm. Okay. And it goes down on either end. So mm. the, the maximum change is around 1200. Now, if you have two inch material, it's around 600. Mm. And if you have four inch material, it's around 300. What does that tell you? Mm. Every time you change the thickness of the material, you lower the Q or you lower the frequency of the Q by half of the frequency. Right. Which means you can predict what's going to happen with six inch or eight inch or ten inch, yes. 
yes. because it's going to move downward. Okay, that's one of the things that's been discovered is we can actually predict what's going on here a little bit. Right, right. But but what what it did tell us was this: we. Oh, how do I say this? <laughs> God, I'd, I'm trying real hard not to sound stupid here. Uh, you can, oh God. <laughs> John, help. <laughs> uh, I, I remember where we were with this thing and I got off in this other angle here. Yeah, uh, we, we're talking about the percentage of error that is. That oh, yes, thank found. you. Okay. So mm -hmm. when, when, I, when, I, when I tabulated all this stuff, we found that the predicted, uh, the difference between the predicted using the standard uh, absorption and our prediction and the actual measurements was 85% error. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was like, what are, are you so, kidding? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so uh, effectively speaking, we... All, all the rooms formula, resigned till now are wrong. The, 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 formulas, <laughs> the, the formulas that we're considering are fundamentally absolutely flawed and they are completely out of place if if 85 percent you don't you don't consider 85 percent as a uh, something that with it, which is within the bounds of acceptable limits at all so <laughs> but 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 we've been doing that for 100 years right right and, okay. we're, and we're actually we're getting by it's not yeah, we're getting by. but yeah, it can keep, keep... be way better we can do so much better well you know? okay now here's the difference between a consultant who is purely science-based and a consultant who uses experience. Okay. So if you have people like Leo Veranic and he'll tell you, well, if you have this in an audience area, you should probably just as a general rule, increase the area or the volume by 10%. Now, why? Because in reality, when we actually measure the rooms, you needed that extra 10% to come up with the actual reverb time. Okay. So what's happened is, there's a whole bunch of guys out there that were called golden ears for years. Uh, Leo Brannick's one of them. Okay, there's a number of other people like that. What they've learned over experience for years is that you take what numbers there are, and by experience, you increase them by certain percentages in order to come up with an answer that actually makes sense. Well, when we actually measure these things in the way we're doing now, we find out that the amount of absorption increases by just about that much. <laughs> based upon the edges and and that's what we're doing now is we're now converting these measurements to a, a usable number that can be used by scientific people who don't have golden ears and be able uh, to figure this out and this I is called I, magic sauce I think I would also like to say that probably the application of physics uh, I've just uh, written that on the chat window also like uh, Application of physics to acoustics, I think, is a more contemporary uh, kind of uh, application because, uh, uh, and especially the study of uh, acoustics in a more uh, 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 like a fluid dynamics approach. I think that's something that has been done very recently. Uh, of course, you have more and more uh, research being done, but I think uh, the traditional approach of uh, 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 considering it as a, uh, a pure wave or let's say a ray tracing approach is 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 fundamentally flawed. But okay. it's, it's flawed in like when you're dealing with the wave end or the bottom end. And the thing yeah. is that designers uh, doing home theaters or, or studios are, are too focused on the ray region. Yeah. And it, yeah. I've yeah. always said this. If you could, if you get 20 hertz to 350 hertz right, right. you got your yeah. audio. You're good, you're, good, you're good to go. You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, that, that's the key is, 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 you know, we do everything based upon light analysis. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's all dependent upon frequency. And when you get below a certain frequency, it, it falls apart. It's okay? exactly and the, sound. It's, it's exactly it's exactly the same reason that we say that uh, at low frequencies uh, we tend tend to be more omnidirectional, and whereas in in the case of uh, uh, high frequencies we try try to be more directional. So that's exactly yeah. the point. I'll, yeah. And uh, Norman makes a very good point. Uh, ray acoustics is very easy. Absolutely correct. I, I think. Uh, the moment you talk, talk about uh, multi-dimensional uh, things, you're talking about uh, uh, integral functions and more cal complicated calculus involved, and which makes matters uh, difficult for uh, a lot of people. The Everybody more well, that, that, just that, wants that, to that, do it the easy yeah. way. You let, know? let me make some, let me make something here a little little a little thing to think about here. Uh, when I first started this process, uh, I I 
had been hearing from uh, Leo and other people about how NIST here local, that would have been the National Institute of Science and Science Technology. And technology. Right. Yeah. And that and that was originally another name previously, uh, the National um, something other council or whatever it was. It, it, it was uh, for standards, uh, NS, NSC, something like that. And the point here was, is these are the, this is the government agency that is supposedly to take all the science, and put it in one spot and do the research. And they would pay for all that. And there was uh, the very, the very first uh, uh, Anacoa chamber was built uh, for Bell Labs by uh, Leo uh, Branick. 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 Mm. Right. And, and they built it for the NIST. Okay. They also built reverb rooms for the NIST. At one time, the uh, NIST had the largest uh, anechoic chamber in the world. It was like 120 feet by 120 feet. It was huge. Okay. So I called the NIST in, in 2009 when I first started talking about the Zedge effect thing. And I got this guy answered the phone and he was a nuclear physicist. And I said, can you pass me on to the, to the acoustics people? Uh, well, we don't have any acoustics people here. I says, it's part of physics. What happened? Oh, well, we tore the Anaco chamber down a few years ago and we tore down the reverb chambers a number of years ago because, you know, it was a settled field back in the 1800s. We don't need to discover uh -huh. anything more because there's nothing more. Uh, the basic Ooh, knowledge of acoustics is there. there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we discovered all the basics. So all the rest of this is just trimmings on it. And I'm looking <laughs> at it going, really? How wrong could we be? <laughs> how wrong could we uh, be? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna so, comment on on so on somebody commented about about changes and and what we're discussing now and the, the discoveries that we have now, is that oh science is only ever beaten by better science and yes. that's this is how we do it we we stack it it's never like we'll we'll never discover that oh all of this is wrong and it but it's and it's this no we'll, we'll, we'll just add to it we just stack on it and it'll go this direction or this direction and that's fine but that's what we want we just want to get yeah no, norm is right science evolves and right. but it exactly. also evolves based upon the fact you have better tools right okay True. and the, the reason we're we're getting all this stuff that you're getting now is because of the uh, the facility we have okay the average reverb room in the in the world is around 200 to 210 cubic meters. Okay, if you look at the cubic meters and calculate the Schrader uh, integrals, it it rolls over and dies at around 160 to 200 hertz. Mm. This means that any time you measure anything that is lower in frequency than 160 to 200, you're making the best. Mm. Yeah, you're, you're making the best guess. Is all you're doing. Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a I would say a, a very poor guess. Yeah, it's, it, but it's a guess. The point is, is yeah. if you look at all the data that's been published for the last 100 years, it all goes, oh, well, we can measure all the way down to 80 hertz. No, you can't. You can measure to 160 to 200 hertz, and then you make a best guess after that. So all right. this data that we've had for absorption has been really it's, restricted to around 200 hertz. It is extrapolation based on uh, what we have. Yeah, and a lot of times the extrapolation is wrong. Yeah, it's <laughs> okay. wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. So, yeah. so what's happened is, is I got asked, 25 years ago to open a laboratory and I couldn't figure out how to make a better laboratory. So why duplicate what already is out there? So I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited. And I finally decided that I was going to open a laboratory and I, 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 in doing so, I wanted to have the largest reverberation rooms available in the world for this particular service. Now there are other reverb rooms that are much larger, but they're not used for this, this project, this type of mm -hmm. measuring. Mm -hmm. So Ours is 737 cubic meters. Ooh, holy. Uh, yeah, it's a big room, okay? In doing so, because of its size, the the we have five overlapping modes at 20 hertz, hmm. which means we can measure 20 hertz as accurately as anybody else can measure 200 hertz. Right. And wow. what you're seeing now is the results of what we're doing. We're showing... Now, the low frequency things that are going on, and we can reproduce those over and over and over again with repeatability of better than 95%. Wow. So uh, Norm brought up something uh, a little while ago. John, you have it, I think. That's 7064. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me show you that. Can, can, you, can you put that graph up? Yes, I can. Let me 
find my folder. Uh, the, the, these so, are things uh, that, you, so you understand, John has been spending enormous amounts of money hmm. to measure these, quote, normal materials we use for design, for, for recording studios and listening rooms and stuff. And one of the things that's been out there, and John has been propagating as well as a whole bunch of other people, is that, that 706 is the most popular material out there. It's a Owens Corning 706, six pound density. Uh, that it can't do low frequencies. It's too hard. It reflects low frequencies. Okay. And again, John has, has been really good about this. And, 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 and take my word for it. I can tell you that eating crow is not like that. Okay? No, it's not. <laughs> it, it, uh, I've had to go back and apologize to two or 300 students over the years about things I taught 10 years ago because it was wrong. You know, uh, now, did I know it at the time? No, I taught at the time what was available out there. Now I know better. So I had to go back and call all my friends up and say, guys, what I taught you is bullshit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so hey, here's what's happening. Well, John's been doing the same thing. And one of these things is 706. Okay. Right. We, 706. We... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's scary what we found. <laughs> it really yeah. is. <laughs> here, right here. I'm going to show you. Here, I'm going to show you right here. Okay. So this is. Four inches, just four inches. Now, wow. do a quarter wave wow. calculation. Do a quarter wave calculation. Have four inches thick of fiber. What are you going to get? You're going to get not much. Yeah, not much, okay. right? Wow. But this is the the real test. And and we did a uh, we also did six inches, and it yes. didn't really improve very much. No, and at, at, at two inches rolled off at about 100 hertz, 120 hertz, something like that. So uh, yeah. I, I, on, a, on a slightly on a slightly uh, lighter note, I would like to just uh, point out, uh, John and Ron, uh, please change the uh, y-axis uh, uh, to absorption constant and remove the word coefficient. As soon as we get the standards people to agree to that. <laughs> yes. no. No, uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think any standards committee need to agree about that. Coefficient always is going to be less than one. So there, there is no question of any yeah. agreeing to that. It's, it's a fundamental. <laughs> uh, it's a fundamental. <laughs> well, yeah. And, 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 and he, yeah. Now, I, I do have to. I do have to to uh, caution people that this is very wide. Okay, it's all the way down to eighty hertz. Okay, okay. and it's very even all the way across. So mm -hmm. if you judge materials, you can judge them two different ways, effectiveness and, and balance. Mm -hmm. This is a very well-balanced material. Very well-balanced. Yeah. Okay. Effectiveness, there's other materials that are more effective. They have higher absorption coefficients that are up in like 1.1, 1.2, and stuff like that. But they're only at very special space. Like 703 has that big bolt at around 80 hertz that goes up about 20 dB louder. But it's only at that one point. It actually rolls off at the higher end. So we have those measurements too, and we have materials like PET here's, and all kinds of stuff. So here's here's pink stuff. Yeah. Here, here's the pink stuff, pink fluffy. This is eight inches thick. Okay. We get way up there in the in the in the low frequency region here. Wow. Really mm -hmm. nice. All the way down to uh, oh, 70 hertz. Wow. Yep. An easy 70 yeah. hertz. There. And, and this is the stuff you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or someplace like that. It's right. it's it's called Owens Corning Pink. That's what it's called. It's called Pink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. What's and the, and uh, what would be the uh, the primary material composition? Uh, Norman, if you fiberglass. Maybe chicken? Fiberglass. It's fiberglass. Fiberglass. Yeah. It's the same stuff you put in your walls for insulation in your ceiling. Uh, right. It's, it's uh, used it's, basically it's, for heat insulation, I suppose. Heat insulation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and if you look oh, at it by yes. the R number, this is R, R13, R15, and R30. Okay, so that's three inches thick, six inches thick, and 12 inches thick. <laughs> okay, and that's what we measured along the way. And this is all the same density. It's around 2.4 pounds per square uh, for cubic foot. Wow. So it's mm -hmm. very light. This is the stuff you go down and buy, you know, in, in bales. And aren't, up aren't, uh, now I just want okay. Uh, this is off the topic of uh, acoustics, but uh, aren't these materials generally, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fire hazard potential fire hazard, or uh, like uh, let's no. say, uh, no. not really? Okay. No, these are fiberglass. Glass, glass, glass no. and burn. Okay, not glass not, okay. is made from sand. 
Fiberglass right. is made yeah. from sand. Okay. Rock uh, was made from basalt rock. Neither right, right. of them burn. Uh, of course. Now, right. But I've, uh, what, I've, about, what about, uh, let's say, uh, I, okay, fair enough. I take my, uh, I, I get the point. Right. Fair yeah. 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 No, they're fireproof. They're considered fireproof materials. Now, I have right. seen, I've seen tests that fiberglass does tend to ball up a little bit when it gets very hot. Okay. Right. Right. The glass is really thin and it'll heat up quick and just kind of ball up like a like when you're burning your hair. <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't burn, it just melts. Right? Actually, I'm sorry, I, I, I raised the wrong question. I actually what I meant to ask was from the point of view of health hazards, because a lot of people talk about no, uh, potential carcinogenic care. Yeah. Yeah, they're known to be uh, having some health hazards. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people um, are slightly hesitant in using uh, glass wool and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm taking that. It's, it's, it's a part. It's a particle size that gets inside your lungs. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same as as asbestos stuff like that. Okay, in that right. respect, yes, you 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 put a film on the front of this stuff that it can be either a a uh, uh, acoustically transparent uh, acoustically yeah, transparent. Uh, Scrim, like a scrim. Yeah, a fabric. Scrim, of, what, what I use in all my treatment designs, I put a thin layer, of, you know, quarter inch of Dacron or, or mm, polyester mm, batting. They use mm. it for filters and just put it on there. And then yeah, you put okay. your fabric over it. And the, the, the Dacron or the polyester is usually nice and white. So it just shows the color of the fabric. And if you have this rock wool or, 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 or the rigid fiberglass or whatever, the pink stuff, it's pink. You don't want that yeah. showing through. So you yeah. put the background there, it protects from fiber uh, egress and, and, right. and yeah. 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 Because, yeah, Mm, very true. Norman, I think, addresses that point. So there is a perception in the market. I I, I might be wrong completely that uh, Norman has addressed it, uh, saying that there's no report of uh, uh, like any yeah. kind of health hazard. The thing so is, it, this is what I've always <laughs> said, and I don't I, I don't know. You know, you 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 mentioned uh, like a asbestos, Ron. It's it's not. It's no. It's, it's, it's but I'm, I'm talking about the fiber size. Yeah, fiber size. It, it's it's an irritant. Wear yes. a mask. I don't yeah. know. You know, if you're not wearing a mask, what is like, like uh, uh, the the comedian, um, um, damn, what's his name? <laughs> says, what is wrong with you? You know, mm -hmm. if you're yeah. not wearing a mask, you know. Well, okay. Th think about you're when, you're, when you're, yeah, when you're installing it. I mean, you wear a mask, you wear a a coverall uh, to make sure that the glass doesn't touch your skin because it's glass. <laughs> right. It will cut you. Okay, yeah, right. it will cut yeah. you. You know, and if it gets in your lungs, it will lodge yeah. in your lungs as fibers, right. and, it, right. and it won't dissolve. It doesn't dissolve, so therefore, right. it will it will cause uh, it will cause injury. But that's the yeah. least of the worries. Okay, the right. problem I think that people are having with these products is the binding agents that are used to assemble. Right, them, right. right? right. you need to let them air out. That's right. That's, that's the problem usually. Absolutely. Uh, my whole family, I'm not allergic to anything. I could I could probably eat rocks and I'm fine. Uh, but <laughs> I'm serious. But my wife and children, they, they have asthma and they have uh, uh, allergies and uh, histamine reactions to almost everything. So, damn. Uh, but yeah. I got glass, I got rock wool panels, which I don't like. I, I like much less than glass wool because rock wool here, at least, get, is crumbly and gets a powder leaves a powder residue sometimes and that turns to dust and it causes allergies and whatnot but it's the binder system in this stuff that's right. horrible and i think I, the binder is the key because that's what is going to decide the porosity and all those uh, aspects yeah, it's the vocs yep yeah yeah yeah, so yeah let it air out just let it air out put it in the garage open it up let it air out first and then you're right. good leave it for right. a week yeah, right. Fennel asked, yeah, we tested ceramic wool. Yes, we've tested ceramic wool. We've checked rock wool. We've checked fiberglass. We've checked all kinds of things. I think, uh, uh, and again, I, John, John I, is I'm, right. It has to do with binder. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm due for sending my samples too in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you yeah. should. You really should. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to find out what, how, that, how that works out. Well, because, what, uh, one of the things interesting is, John, you should probably pull up the four-inch or six-inch PET. 
Oh, oh yeah, this this stuff <laughs> so is this, this is this is supposedly the stuff that's supposed to help you get rid of fiberglass and rock wool, and it's made mm -hmm. out of polyester, and it binds together. It's woven together rather than just bound together, so there's no binders. It's, made, in it. it's kind of like made like a felt, you know, like yeah, they, like it's under pressure. Um, yeah. Okay, I got. Here's here's four inches. Compressed back. compressed polyfill. It's yes. kind of, but it's yeah, yeah. So this is four inches thick. Hmm. Now look, I want you to notice something here. What it? What the heck is this? It's over 0.9 at 40 hertz, and this is only and, four inches thick. Yeah, and let me let me point out something to you. That same hmm. peak is the two inches and six inches. It's almost like a notch filter. Yeah. yeah, it has to do. It has to do with how this stuff is constructed. Okay, this stuff mm -hmm. is compressed like felt. So, wow. so what happens is if you if you First if you look at the material, is. yeah, if 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 you look at this stuff, yeah, here's the two inch. There it is too. See, mm. so two, four, and six. Look, at six drops down mm -hmm. to. Again, 70 hertz here very effectively. Yeah. And then from, from about 42 to 28. Uh, Ron, could this be the effects of maybe some uh, microscopic uh, uh, like uh, absorption? No. What this, what this is, is again, the situation. When you do fiberglass or rock wool or anything else, you use a binder to hold together the particles. Right. In, in PET, it's done by compression. So what yes. happens is... You have a variable density going from the outside to the inside, back out to the outside. So it gets it gets more dense towards the center and less dense towards the outside because of the mm -hmm. way it's made. And, right. and what you're seeing there is a resonance in the density as the sound okay. goes through it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's a different material, uh, and it reacts differently because of the variable uh, density. So we have we have just recently come up with. Uh, 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 another option of a material composition, so which is exactly like a, a replacement for a PET. So we have uh, come up, uh, come, uh, come to that with uh, a formulation based on wood fibers. So yeah, uh, right? yeah. So uh, I hate a... to tell you, but but I, I, Cardi, you may not be happy about hearing this, but okay. we've had material here that I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. Uh, is made out of wood fibers held together by concrete. No, the the binding the binding out here is not concrete. It's a, it's a natural binder. So I will yeah. I will I will I'll share the details with you uh, uh, on yeah. on an email, and we'll we'll yeah. take that forward. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's around not, here not, in the United States, we we had something that, that was bound together with cement. But the point is, it was made out of wood fibers, and right. and it was at different thicknesses, and uh, and no, it worked very very wood. well. This is not wood wool, uh, Johnny. Uh, this is a slightly different uh, concept. Uh, wood wool, in fact, uh, the one which I showed you earlier uh, is uh, like a replacement for wood wool. This is made out, yeah. out of coconut coir. So this actually, yeah. uh, actually, the the uh, the image won't do justice uh, to what you're seeing because uh, this is a very very fine, uh, like there's a lot of fibrous material uh, inbuilt. It's compressed uh, coconut coir. So uh, that would be interesting to test. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, you you got to yeah. send that. You really? Yeah, I, I will. I will. I will. I will. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and Fennel said it's going to be expensive to get it tested. It, it's just as expensive for you as it is for John. You can calculate that for every, every absorptive test you do, it's going to be around $1,000. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just take a few questions. A few. I'll just ask a few. Uh, I'll just uh, maybe direct your attention to to a few questions uh, posed on the chat sure. window. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so Johnny asked a question. Uh, how about width of the tested sample? Does that uh, affect the low frequency absorption? I think of of course. Uh, you it doesn't affect it. It doesn't affect it as much as depth does. Yes, depth. Uh, 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 Johnny, uh, Johnny, you you want to unmute yourself and just maybe uh, articulate that question because I think yeah, uh, Fennel, I'll come to the phrase phase grading question too. Johnny, uh, would you mind unmuting yourself and uh, maybe asking that question from your side? Yes, hi. Uh, basically, yeah, I I was asking when uh, you are, you were talking about uh, the absorption coefficient of uh, the fiberglass, the the dense one, 
So I wanted to know if uh, which will affect uh, the absorption, the amount of absorption on the lowest frequency because uh, we are talking about only four inch and we're getting a lot of absorption on 80 Hertz, let's say. So if let's say the width of the sample will be smaller, will we have the same absorption on the yes, yes, on, you, on these yeah, frequencies? yeah, it's, it's per area, okay, per square. Well, foot. yeah, 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 and, and meter, narrow, a, a different narrow would be narrower. You'd lose a little uh, dimension at the top and bottom, but the, the height's the same. There is very little difference between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the determining factor on absorption in this situation is always the thickness. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other things have, have some effect, but not nearly as much as the thickness does. So basically, uh, it it boils down to saying that if I have a monolithic uh, uh, material or let's say a monolithic kind of a construction, uh, it would not depend too much on the, uh, it would only largely depend on, on the depth. But if I have, let's say, multiple, uh, let's say, structures, then of course the perimeter comes into picture wherein you have multiple, right. uh, multiple edges right. and um, uh, multiple edges which are coming into picture. Right. Can, there, Arctic, and, uh, and can I come in here? Yeah, yeah can you go on. Yeah, so uh, this surface area, the square foot coverage of surface area, will it affect only the amplitude or only the frequency or both? Uh, it affects mostly the frequency. Okay, so in this situation, like I said earlier, when we measured one inch material fiberglass, it peaked at around 1200. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the effect. If you had it with two inches thick, it peaked at 600. And if you had four inches thick, it peaked at 300. No, so, Ron, Ron, I'm not talking about the depth. I'm talking about the, the surface area. Uh, the surface area in this situation was the same for all these. But say if you have the same material, say a two-inch thick material, and one sample is a four-square-feet sample, and the other sample is a 16-square-feet sample. Will they it... will be different. They will be different. Yeah, yeah. obviously. The, the, in, in that's the obvious, isn't it? In, isn't in that obvious? Isn't the, it? No, but in the amplitude, not the frequency, right? Uh, it, no, you'll you'll have some amplitude differences as well, okay? Because in this situation, you have uh, probably absorption coefficients that are exceed one in most cases. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. Okay, oh, so yeah, that that that, I, that will change the that will change the amount of absorption. Exactly, yeah. So okay. the amount of absorption is the frequency right. affected will not change, but the amount of absorption will. Yeah. Well, here's the thing to keep in mind. The frequency will change when you change the apparent, uh, the apparent configuration. So if you have a, a sample that is a square sample that is four by or six by six, eight by eight, and ten by ten, there is a difference in the amount of absorption, but the peak and the frequency ranges will be the same. Okay. Because they're determined by the configuration, which is a square. Right. I get it. Okay. Yeah. And we get so, to uh, so of, basically, uh, to just to uh, put that in perspective, uh, you are always looking for a particular, given a particular surface area that you have, you are always looking to construct the largest perimeter uh, kind of a, a geometry. So for, the answer to that is basically a fractal kind of a construction. So that's the yeah. going, going to give you the best kind of a. Yeah, and, 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 and you know that uh, scientifically that's right. Now the question is. Can you actually put a fractal on a wall and make people uh, uh, go? Uh, exactly. That looks exactly. nice. So, so there is a practical limit to that. So that's what you. Yeah. So you increase the number of uh, uh, like edges. So simple answer well, to that, as you said, is uh, the, the, the simple the answer star, is the star option. The star yeah, option. Simple, simple, simple answer is a checkerboard pattern. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and and that's... not the standard one. The standard one goes corner to corner. Mm -hmm. What you want to make sure you have that much space all the way around, which means you have a, let's say you have a two foot checkerboard uh, pattern in it. You have two foot of space all the way around that two foot piece. And then you put the right. next piece in. So right. it, it's, it's a very open pattern. I, you know, I, yeah. I can show you some examples of that if you're interested, where we actually have done that with a number of facilities here. And it looks very attractive. People like it. And it's like, yeah. Please uh, but, do show us some examples. We get a better idea of the understanding. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, uh, what, what's interesting here is this is something that Leo Baranek has been, uh, was uh, pushing way back in the 1940s. He always said that, you know, checkerboard patterns work much better 
than hmm. than uh, than a solid piece of absorption. So when you have a room and you put these big you know, four foot by eight foot panels up, hmm. uh, you can actually get three to four times as much absorption by breaking hmm. it into two by two pieces and just scattering around the surface. Absolutely, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. So I do a lot uh, of ceilings like that. Uh, if, yeah, if um, I'm not putting it, if I, I'm not putting a drop ceiling in, I'll put the the uh, I'll, I'll either that on the ceilings, yeah, packing spaces and stuff like that. It's great. Uh, okay. One more question, Ron. Just just one more question. So, Fenil, would you want to ask your face grating question from your own side, please? Yes. Uh, so, the simple question is: What are your experiences uh, with face grating elements in an acoustic space? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Uh, anybody familiar with something called the BAD panel? If you if you're familiar with RPG, yeah, a BAD BAD panel, yeah, a bad panel, yes, yes. So yes talking yes. about yeah, Michael it, Jackson's bad, right? Binary, <laughs> binary, the binary, binary, yeah, RPG bad panels, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that because when I first got into this business, I had to test for for scattering, and we measured it for scattering, and had absolutely no scattering. Okay, which which went against everything that everybody was, was talking about. It. it said it was a great little panel. It did this, did that, and everything else. And it had great diffusion. Well, we measured it for diffusion. It has absolutely no diffusion of any kind. But, and here's the big but. When you looked at the frequency, or not the frequency, but the phase response. Phase response. Hmm. Okay, from about 14K up. Let's not talk about below 14K. Let's talk about above 14K. The phase response went from a very, very uh, coherent pattern to a very incoherent pattern, like a big sea urchin. Mm -hmm. Okay, when I presented that to people here at Applied Physics at University, the bio people said, yeah, your ears interpret that as space. Mm -hmm. and, and my first thought was, well, that's interesting. We've never heard that in acoustics before. And, and, one, and, the, and one of the girls answered, she says, yeah, that's because you guys don't discover the, uh, or, or work with bioacoustics. You work with the architectural acoustics and you guys never got smart enough to figure that out. <laughs> so it was like, it was like, OK, so what? So the way I, I try to put that is I don't know how many of you are guitar players or, or use amplifiers for guitars or anything like that. But there is a there is a uh, there's a company here in the United States called Fender. It yes. makes guitar amplifiers. And yes. they all have a control at the far end called presence. Ah. Okay. Now, if you know anything about electronics, that's that's my specialty is I'm an electronics engineer, is if you look at how it actually operates, it injects 16K hertz noise mm -hmm. into the sound. And what does it do? It makes the sound of the guitar sound like it's in a large echo a chamber. Mm -hmm. Okay, more space, right? Mm -hmm. If you're familiar at all with uh, 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 boards, uh, mixing boards, uh, a company called Mackey, mm -hmm. okay, produced a little dial that says air. Air, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it do? If you turn it up, it injects 16K hertz noise into, mm -hmm. the, into the channel, <laughs> mm -hmm. which makes the sound airier, okay? okay. The point Pre presets. is... Presets, presets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, the point is it increases the noise, right? And doing and, and increasing the noise, by the way, also increases the phase differentials. Yeah, in the sound. Okay, so what's happening here is that these units, when they go into a room, and I have to tell you, I have big concrete empty rooms, lots of them. Okay, I must have five hundred or six hundred of them. Okay, that are you know twenty, thirty, forty. Uh, meters long sometimes and if if i go in there and measure the room impulse response it has a certain response that you know it's there and you can see it if you put these panels on the wall you can definitely hear a difference even though it doesn't change the the impulse response very much but you can definitely hear the room open up and it's like have you ever heard a really open room become even more open <laughs> it's like oh wow that's cool okay so what we figured out was that by changing the phase response at 14 to 16 K to your ears, you re experience this openness. So these bad panels do not have a diffusion characteristic, but they do have a phase rating mm -hmm. characteristic. 
Okay. And, and, and by having phased ratings, you change the phase in huge amounts. And in doing so, you increase the airiness of a room, the openness of the room. It's a subjective thing that your brain hears. It's not something that is physical, but it is your brain interprets it that way. Psycho, psychoacoustical. Psychoacoustic. Bingo. And, and that is the big thing people do not understand is psychoacoustics plays a huge amount in what we hear. And right. you can't measure that. You can only right. observe it. Right. You know, so so does the BAD panel work? Yes. Okay. It works. It doesn't work the way they say it does, but it works. Okay. Right. And and Fennel, what you're asking about is is phase grading elements in an acoustic environment. If you're going to use phase grading elements in an acoustic environment, be aware that it's not going to change the characteristics of the reflections, but it is going to change the characteristics of the room into a more open room. Hmm. Okay. So you I can should, use these should, panels on the wall. I should show uh, what we're doing, what we've been doing recently. I actually, I'm actually, let's see, where is this? Um, I'm, I'm going to open up my AutoCAD and show, show something I've been working on. So, because this is related to studios and uh, home theaters, and and it's some some ideas of what you can do. Um, just a moment. Let me get to the model. I'm going to share screen here. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Here, I'm, let me look at sideways. I'm going to take this stuff off the top. Just, we're going to look down into the room. Conceptual. Come on. You can do it. Change. There we go. All right. So, this is what I'll do with a lot of my rooms. Of course, you're, you're going to put your speakers up along these lines here. If it's mm -hmm. um, um, LCR, then it's LCR. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is all phase grading here behind this. This is, they're open in the back to, 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 to base trapping. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got broadband panels here. Then we've got phase grading here with bass trapping behind it, broadband, bass trap, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this just alternates. Another thing I do around the room is, uh, a, a, I call it an indirect lighting board, but this is cut sharp edges, lots of edges here, same here. The, and to, to reduce flutter in the room, because a lot of people like to record in their control room or the mixing room and in a home theater too, You, if you have enough ceiling height and you're doing Atmos, I put angled panels on the wall. This was only part of it. It angles back up, and then it goes into a drop ceiling, which, which is a, more absorption. Um, and this, basically, these reflectors here, this is a reflector. It keeps the high-frequency high energy in the room a little longer. It doesn't kill it all off. Look at the back of the room. is all phase grading with base trapping behind it. And there's a curve in the back wall as well. A curved rear wall, yeah, baby. That's what that's what uh, John was talking about. Uh, he was alluding to that, right? Uh, providing a kind of a convex uh, shape uh, towards inside. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So it yes. breaks up the pressure wave front. Yes. Yes. So now let let me uh, show you. Let me uh, let me get back to Zoom here. <laughs> I, I've, re I've reduced this thing in such a way that I can't find anything anymore because uh, <laughs> I have I'm looking at something else here. Uh, so it keeps coming up. Um, where the hell? How do I? Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, I can't yeah. share my screen, guys. So somebody has to tell me I can share my screen. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, Curry, just, uh, have to... I'll just give you the option of sharing your screen. One second, one moment, please. Uh, I'll make you I've, got a, I've got a black I mean, magic design I mean, ATIM, so it, it's, I don't need permission. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let me show you. Uh, there we go. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That That is a phase grading. Mm. Okay. That is the same pattern as the BAD panel. Mm. But these are made out of stainless steel. Okay. These can go over any kind of fiberglass. 
and the impedance change between what's in behind these holes and what's on the front is what institutes the phase function. And if you right. see the size of these holes, these are two foot by two foot panels. Right. Okay. So these small holes are all doing phase shifting like crazy at mm. around 14 to 16 K. Right. So this, this is a phase grading panel. Uh, John. Uh, Ron, that's related to the diameter of the hole, is it not? Yes. Yes. And the sharpness of the edges of the hole. Yes. Yep. Okay, so that's why the metal ones are actually better than the standard BAD panels are, which are wood, because right. they have a sharper edge. Right. Okay, by the same token, uh, John, uh, let me, uh, uh, would you bring up your uh, uh, DWGs of the uh, 601 or 601-1? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can, just let's, a minute. Let's, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's do the 601-1, right. let's do the 601-1. Let's see. Let's see, where is it? Oh my goodness. Just a minute. I gotta find my uh this one. And just a minute, getting it. Uh Ron, is there any anything else that you would uh, be sharing from your uh, screen? Uh yeah, there probably is, but we haven't got there yet. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I just, no, I'm just, I'm just asking because uh, I'll retain you as the host uh, till the time uh, you want to share your screen. Yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, do whatever you need to do. We'll, we'll, no, no. we'll work it out. Okay, but, but John, John, uh, you know, I, I can, sh John, if you don't have it, I can share the screen here with that, that same, di uh, same information. The six oh four, you mean? No, the six, the six oh four dash one. Okay. Yeah. 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 I got it. Okay. Here it is. This is this is the AutoCAD. Um, let me share. All right. So this is the this is the, the one over here on the right hand side. The one on the right yeah, hand the right side. hand side. Okay. Now this is just a line drawing of the top. This right. is the dash one. And what we've done, we put the 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 slats going. This is the front of the unit, right? Right here. This the is curve. this is the front. Okay. The, the square is the back, is the yeah. back of the... So, so do you have the 3D drawing of this? I did, just a moment. Yeah. If not, I, I, gotta, can, I can bring... I gotta find it. There's so vent slats test. Yeah, there's, this is it. This is the 3D version. All right, so... There we go. Conceptual. So we can see what's what it's looking like. This is our test version. We sent this off, it built exactly like this. It's, so, yeah, it's four ahead, foot, yeah, it's four foot by four foot. Uh -huh. and, and the idea here is the edges themselves are diffraction gratings. Mm. Okay. They're all in one direction. But the curve is, I think John explained to me, it was a prime 27 curve. Uh, this one was um, quite a bit higher. I don't remember. I got to look it up. Yeah, what whatever it is. Here? I don't know. <laughs> I, I thought you told me it was prime 27, but no, but that's in any the, case. That's that's the other ones. Those are prime 17. This was a 33 or something like that. Something screwy. Okay. But the point is, is at lower frequencies, the curve acts as a reflector. Mm. Because all these surfaces are so close together, they're all the same distance apart. And that when you get a larger wave front, the, the front edges become solid all the way across. Mm -hmm. So now it reflects. So if you look at the actual uh, the GLLs, the actual balloons of these things, you can actually see that these actually reflect all the way down to about 125 hertz, quite nicely. And they're very uh, and they're very asymmetrical. That's the other part. They're very mm -hmm. asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. So this is this is part of what you have to do when you start looking at things. Is is, is if you have a curve, you could take these things and put these on a curve. So you have a curve on a curve. Right, and, and you get really weird things happening, but but it's all predictable, right. and and that's what the whole idea behind here, and that's what John's doing with all these things he's talking about at the front walls and stuff, is this type of thing. We use this particular set of curves on a, a studio that he and I designed together in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and the, all the walls of the performance rooms are done with these things, so they all have these curves and all these things like that. And the, and the place, uh, uh, by the way, I, I found out they did build it, John. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. and, and, and they're very they're very pleased with the sound of the rooms. 
I gotta, I gotta see it, man. I gotta, I gotta get a hold of Hans and find yeah. out what, yeah. what's going on yeah. there. Yeah. So, so in the meantime, just want to, and and then you can do the spacing right now. This spacing is even spacing. So you have, let's say, a three quarter inch board. You have three quarter inch space between them. So they're the same spacing. But you can change these spacings to an MLS or some kind of another series, and they do provide different patterns of of higher frequency uh, diffusion. You know, so, and, and if you fill these things with, uh, not fill them, but put a layer, say four inch fiberglass behind, they also uh, do some absorption functions as well at lower frequencies. So it's, uh, these are very useful. I think John makes these in eight, eight by four foot uh, sections, four right. foot wide, eight foot high. No, to go in a yeah, room. no they're eight foot. Th these are about eight foot by eight foot when they're the, the, the main ones here. Oh, I'll show okay. you uh 604s where is it you, you got more of a problem than i have why well, <laughs> oh, there it is there it is I, is they're supposed to be like in num numerical order okay oh. so this is 604 by the way 604 is it a 60 by 40 kind of diffraction yeah, it's all, it's all about eight by eight but it comes in two sections it's two pieces this oh. is the piece that we tested basically the left side of this or the you know, the left side facing it and then I I want to test this side too, and you know that way I can put both GLLs together, kind of in, in okay. It's going to do this here, and it's going to do that there, and it's going to shape the sound in this way. Uh, these are the yeah. this, the let's, standard six oh four. What we were looking at here is the six oh four dash one, which the slats are facing, are going in inside like that. So it's very interesting. Yeah, it be, it definitely was more effective than the six oh four was. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah. So it's just you know, but but again, maybe we just used a whole bunch of terminology that people are not familiar with, and one of them <laughs> is is GLL. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. GLL is a a a, a, a uh, speaker lab file. Yeah, it's a, it's a speaker lab file. Speaker lab being a software package provided mm -hmm. by AFMG out of Berlin. And it's used to describe what speakers do. So you can look right. at the at the directivity balloons of a speaker. Well, what is a diffuser? It's a speaker without a voice coil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. So the idea here is if you illuminate the diffuser from outside and you then go from that point and measure just like you do a speaker, now you can get a directivity balloon of a diffuser by using the first order reflections and by isolating those. And, and what's, what's happening here is in ease, you can put a GLL of a speaker in a room and it'll act, it will illuminate the room using the directivity balloon exactly the way the speaker will. And therefore you can see reflections from corners and all kinds of stuff. And, and you know, you can tune the aiming of your speakers, how they cover, and, what type of speaker you use, whether it's 60 by 40 or 60 by 20 or whatever, okay? Well, you can do the same thing with diffusers now. Uh, now, does the, the software support it directly? No, you have to do a workaround, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Because in the, in, in the program, speakers always speak at zero time. And then it mm -hmm. calculates from zero time to the running time to where it hits a wall or whatever it is, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't have another source that that speaks on its own because it's there hmm. okay so but you can create this balloon that you can put on the wall say 50 feet away okay now how do you get it to speak in time that's easy you measure the distance between the speaker and that wall and you calculate that in milliseconds hmm. and then you delay it so let's say 50 milliseconds so the speaker speaks 50 milliseconds later the diffuser speaks, just like it would be if it were struck by the speaker. And now you can see what the effect of your diffuser in the room is. And the nice thing about this is if you have a single diffuser measured like a two by two, you can put them together in a GLL function as a um, cluster, like you would a speaker. So if you had like three speakers put together in a cluster, you can calculate what the resultant balloon is based upon uh, the complex addition of ma uh, magnitude and phase and have a resultant uh, uh, balloon of those three or four speakers. Well, you can do the same thing with diffusers as well. So you can take these diffusers, put them on a wall, 
And let's say you have a six wide and two high array of these diffusers. Put them together, call them a cluster, recalculate the entire overall uh, uh, diffusion balloon that comes off that entire array. And now you can put that on the wall. And when you speak at it, the entire rear wall will react as if it were a whole uh, array of, of, of diffusers in these things. So now you can use your diffusers in these, in these programs by just that simple workaround by calculating what the delay time is. So these are things that, that are, uh, uh, they're, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? They're not, they're not patented, but they're uh, uh, copyrighted. There we go. Yeah, proprietary yeah. copyrights. So GLL is a proprietary uh, a method. Uh, there's other software that can read these, thing, these same files uh, that are out of Germany and stuff. So you don't have to have Speaker Lab, but for the cost of it, I'm sorry, just buy the stupid program. <laughs> it's not that expensive. <laughs> it's only a couple hundred dollars. Uh, Ron, I'll just, uh, once again, uh, bring us, uh, let's uh, get back to some questions that are being asked. Sure. So, so, so Fennel has a question, uh, which is quite, I think, a, call, a nice question. Well, uh, what about a room uh, shaping that is uh, balls playing? And is that a, is that a, uh, a recommended practice or is it uh, recommended to have a, a simple rectangular room? Let me, I, I, let me I, yeah, I'm going to let John answer this one. Okay. Um, a rectangular cuboid is the easiest. Um, it is the easiest thing to calculate yeah. and to be sure. You can you can calculate it and that's it. This is what you get. But you you splay the walls and you go, there's there's some a lot of unknown here because you're you're when you splay walls, you do not get rid of modes. You're still going to have them, but they're going to change every centimeter or so, or every inch. You know, it's going to change, right? Uh, so uh, the, the the point being, John, that I uh, is there any benefit of splaying? I don't think so. Not in my there, mind. There, there there are benefits to reflecting uh, situations, but agree. There, uh, but they're I, offset I by by the problems with modal analysis. Right. It, I, I put, I use angled brooms and weird stuff going on in tracking spaces. And that's wonderful because it breaks things up. And a tracking space is a creative space. You know, if you're, you have a tracking room in a big studio, I mean, if you have a big rectangle, that's fine. You treat it properly. It's great. But, but you often want to do some modal analysis on it a, a bit. Now, in a room that has a booth in it, built into it and you've got other stuff in it that's, that's different shapes that will change the, 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 the resonance activity within that space, then that breaks it up somewhat. you got an angled wall. That's fine. But as far as a, a mixing, mastering, uh, listening, critical listening space, Keep it straight simple. and treat keep properly. It. Yeah, keep it simple, John, stupid. <laughs> John, yeah. and, uh, the, John the, the, the room that you showed us, uh, the console uh, room on that studio, you had mm -hmm. splayed both the speaker walls. Is that for soffit mounting the speakers so that they are angled? I usually, usually do, but I, I like to take advantage of that area and space okay. for trapping. Okay. And I, I, I angle my walls, the front walls in, at 25 degrees, not 30. And the reason for that, I want your speakers to be aligned with those walls, but in position. So this the this, the horizontal dispersion of a, of a good speaker is quite wide, at least 90 degrees, if not more, quite often, okay? And so you can be in the center without it pointing at your nose and even pointing out here, left and right. You're still getting a really good focus. But when you get up and walk around the room and, and ponder, and you know, which I used to do when I was mixing, I'd get up, pace back and forth and listen, and I'd sit back down. And you should maintain your stereo image. A lot of times in, in some studios I work, you got the, the speakers sitting on the console right there and they're pointed right at your nose. And you got to sit there like this to listen to it. And as soon as you move like this, you can't hear it right. It's it, You're missing a lot. So... It's evolved into a 25 degree angle. So it spreads out a little bit. You get a lot wider sound stage where you can move around and 
you're not strapped in your chair with a vice on your head. Uh, you know, yeah. Will this, not, is, this is not clockwork orange. We, we, this, we don't make like that. <laughs> will this, will this uh, help in home theater rooms? Uh, splaying yes. uh, front, left, and right uh, kind of. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think if you get a good wide dispersion speaker, LCR flat. That's the way I would do a home theater. Okay. Yeah. Just, here's something. Here's something to think about, and and, and Norm can chime in on this as well. Uh, you have to determine when you're listening what type of thing you're going to listen for, okay? Because you could be in a, a concert hall with a, uh, a orchestra, and the idea is to have the sound appear to come from everywhere, okay? You don't want to you don't want to localize it. It's it's like a church. If you if you're in a big church like a European style church or uh, cathedral, the idea behind the the architecture in this situation was so that you would uh, have the sound appear to come from heaven. Okay, so the organ was made and the, and the architecture was such that when the organ played, the sound appeared to come from above you, around you, and, and through you. Mm -hmm. and it's the same way with the choir. That's why the choir was behind you rather than in front of you, was to be up high enough to be able to reflect through all these surfaces, all these various surfaces, so it sounded like the angels were singing. That was the idea. Okay, so if you want to be in a room like that or a concert hall and you want to be in the audience, you want to be able to experience the orchestra in total rather than individual. Mm. So now you look for a diffuse uh, uh, image. Mm. By the same token, if you want to be in a nightclub and you have a combo in front of you with four or five pieces, you want to have imaging. So you want to know that if the organ player is playing, he's over on the left-hand side over there, and the drummer is over on the right-hand side, and the singer is in the center. Okay, so you want to have imaging. Now, imaging and the other way of experience sound are polar opposites. Okay, you cannot be in a room that does both equally. That doesn't mm -hmm. exist, okay? That, that's one of the reasons people who design rooms, concert halls and, and, and clubs and stuff, have to, to, you have completely different things going on, okay? So you have to design the room to do what you want to do. So what you're saying is, can we have a listening room that does both? No, <laughs> okay? That's a, that's a simple answer. No, you can't have. So you have to decide what type of music or type of sound you want to have. It's That's very wrong. Uh, it's very it's very application. It's very application oriented. I, yeah. I'll just uh, Benil, just one second. Then I'll just uh, uh, I'll just uh, make you ask you a question once one moment. So essentially, uh, if I have to summarize what uh, Ron mentioned, these are very application specific uh, kind of uh, geometries that you're talking about. Uh, one geometry cannot overlap with uh, like you cannot have let's say an application which is talking about a concert hall kind of experience and merge that with uh, 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 having the same okay. geometry that replicate a, 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 a let's say a, a reproduction kind of environment. I don't think. How that do would... you how do you talk to a client? So you tell a client, wait a minute. If you want to going to listen to orchestral music, I got to design the room this way. If you're going to watch a big bang, big bang action, no. thing, uh, I got to design uh, the room uh, this uh, way. No. Can I just can I just attempt can I just attempt to answer that question uh, and correct me if I'm wrong? Uh, so that is where the uh, the problem uh, probably what you can end up using is scattering. Uh, so uh, the acoustic treatment of the room also gives you some flexibility in trying to uh, let's say change the uh, uh, what you can bring into the picture in terms of what you can offer to the client. Isn't that right? Well, let, let me let me kind of jump in here a little bit because Norm will tell you the same thing I will. I, I think he will. And that is depends on what your treatments are. So right. if you want if you want quadratic type of, of treatments like quadratic scatter and stuff like that, you're going to get phase change. And when you get phase change, you're going to lose localization. OK, so the idea here is in order to be able to have localization, you have to maintain the phase of the originating sound. So the only way to do that is by reflecting sound in the, in the room using a specular reflector rather than a quadratic type reflector. So now you're going to use things like barrels or pyramidals or sphericals, stuff like that, geometric type uh, reflectors. And so you put those on the sidewall in order to maintain the phase relationship 
from the sound because it goes out, hits the reflector, okay, and comes off specular, which means it maintains the phase. The phase change as you move through uh, through space. If you hit a quadratic, you're going to scramble the phase completely and lose whatever localization there is. So there's two ways of doing this. One is you make a room that does one or the other. The other is a more expensive way of doing it. That is you take the barrel diffuser and put it on one side of a, a, a rotating panel and you put a quadratic on the other side and you put it on the wall so you can rotate it around and you have variable acoustics. Variable acoustics. Uh, uh, yes. acoustics yeah. A lot of people May I come in here and say yes. something? Yes. Okay. Um, Norm just said there are performance spaces and producing spaces. And and yes. I, I think so, some of our audience may be confused by our banter about these two things, okay? Whereas we were supposed to be talking about like uh, listening room, critical listening, mixing, mastering, uh, home theater, et cetera. These kind of spaces are should be designed uh, well, designed right, the target spot is larger than when poorly designed, is what, what Norm said. And I agree, it should be as large as possible. Uh, and it should be, you, you should have a focus sound in any of these spaces. Now, in a performance place, it's different. You, you want to use the side polys, you want to have cross correlation, all these things that help you localize the sound on stage and you have you get more enjoyment out of the performance. That's completely different than these small rooms where we're mixing, mastering, listening to just critically listening to music or having a home theater experience. Uh, you want it. You want it pretty tight and right. Now, these diffraction yeah. units, you can have past the point of reflections, and they give space to the room that so that you're not in a dead room. You don't want to ever, you don't want to be in a dead room. That's but you can be in a very tight, you know, acoustically tight room that sounds good and feels good to be in. It's yeah, all I, so yeah. there's yeah, one and, and, question, and, and, John, that that comes up is what's the ratio between absorption and diffraction or reflection uh oh. and pitch. it's like is it the first one third <laughs> which is really absorption a ratio and no There's the no. first one third of the room is absorption and the ne next no no, no 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 we're, we're no. falling back into the old live in dead in criteria yeah. which which had some great ideas but a lot of it was not not really true no it, I'm, it, I'm talking it as this, specifically to home theater rooms Home theater rooms, yeah, you don't want to live in dead end, no. Because uh, I, aren't, aren't the surrounds supposed to be diffuse? You don't want to localize your surrounds because then you're 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 falling well, into the exit door effect. How are you going to diffuse them? Uh, by putting your diffusers and around the uh, that doesn't diffuse and using the surrounds using dipole surrounds maybe. Uh, dipole surrounds are often nice, but you, you put the surrounds up to where they're they're distant and perhaps you can have a diffusing grid in front of them uh, if you want to do that i've never i've never thought of doing that i don't think it's i at one time years ago i designed a home theater where we had the surround speakers facing a diffuser you know like a quadratic mm -hmm. yes and, yes. Oh. It, and then that <laughs> broke it up into the room but i i don't know how that worked Mars, out uh, Mars, Mars, can i come in on this did you want to say more of a reverberant surround field than a diffuse surround field no, not a reverberant, but a diffuse. Okay. So if you don't diffuse want a diffuse, field, diffuse, no, no, no. Basically, you do not want a diffuse field in a yeah. listening space like this because you want what you want to hear. You want to be able to hear what the producer, engineers, design wrote into the program material that's being put to this speaker, that speaker, that speaker, this speaker, and and to give you the experience that they programmed into it otherwise you're you're just you're like adding i'm adding a big reflection over here and a big one over here that wasn't in, in the original movie or in the original track so you're you're broadening your experience yeah it's nice but it's not original it's not what they wrote and then the that, that's that's what i term accurate or expansional you know you can you can put phase grading on the left and right sides of your home theater where you, where you get a lot of comb filtering and, and and sounds more spacious and stuff it's changing the whole character of the sound and it's not what was written onto the disc that you're yeah, it's in. not basically it's not basically faithfully reproducing what was intended no, so it is not that's it, exactly it, right no so it's I, not, I, I, hmm. Karthik, I have one last question before i leave 
Uh, we've been talking about all the tools that acoustic designers or acousticians have beginning from absorption to reflection to diffusion or scattering, but we've not really touched upon redirection of sound. In oh, terms yeah. Of, yeah, so uh, <laughs> that's, we need to talk about that. Well, is that, is that's what we're just, we're actually discussing that right now. And that is redirection of sound. By the way, uh, that's otherwise known as a new method of describing reflections okay yes yes, yes. <laughs> so so instead of having a reflective surface we have a redirective surface and that's to mm. that's to define it from a diffractive surface okay mm. uh but in reality uh geometrics are the only things out there that are good at redirecting sound and and now the question becomes where do you want to redirect the sound to okay Indeed. if you want to do it in, in a horizontal method use something like a uh, uh a uh uh, a variable diameter cylinder. Okay, so uh, you have different uh, radiuses, and they vary. So you have this. The surface looks like a, a like a drum uh, surface of it that's round. Okay, and that will reflect the sound in a horizontal direction only. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way of doing this, and the method a lot of us use now in, in concert halls, is spherical surfaces. So if you take a sphere and you do a cut across. Uh, the the surface of it at some point it doesn't have to be a, a diameter it can be any any point and you end up with a section of a, of a surface uh, you put that on the wall and now it directs redirects the sound in a spherical method uh, in it's all like directions a, it's like a, it's like a convex lens convex lens yes it's a convex lens it's exactly it mm -hmm. and and the point is it reflects back in all directions therefore it gives uh... you more of a uh yeah it, so it's it's one of these things where yeah, I, I use uh, a lot of these I, I'm gonna see I'm gonna do, uh, there is okay, a point we'll to stop, I might do the, the okay I, I have somebody but it's gonna take so long so the question is how to do it I I'm not sure who's talking here my head hurts since yesterday oh uh Lud Bjorn uh, okay, if, if there's a question okay. from the audience, I'm, I'm sorry, I had to mute the, the person. I'm sorry, I, I'm not able to pronounce the name. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so if there's a question from the audience, uh, please unmute yourself and ask a question. There was also a background noise. I would request uh, uh, to avoid, uh, let's say, crosstalk. So yeah, if there's a question, please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Uh, the gentleman uh, with uh, uh, starting with L J U U D. I'm sorry, I'm not able to pronounce the name. So, uh, if there's a question from your side, Lyud is there... Yeah, yeah, Lyud Bornen. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't think so. Okay. It probably might have been in, in okay, uh, Yeah, by, by, by mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, so the point is, it. so we re we use these these partial spheres in the ceiling. So we put them up in the ceiling so that the sound gets distributed across the entire area from mm -hmm. the reflections of the ceiling area. And, and they're, support, they're supported up there and, and, you know, hanging from chains and stuff like that. And they work really good. Uh, right. but, but, but the only reason you use these is to maintain localization. Hmm. Okay. So, so this is part of what we're talking about. Do you, want, do you want localization? Like if you're listening to a movie. You want to know where the sound is coming from in the movie. So if a person is talking to you in the movie, you don't want the sound of that person's voice coming from the right side when they're standing on the left side. Uh, it drives you crazy. You don't like it. You stop listening. It, it, it's just there's a, a part of your brain that goes, nope, this is right. Okay. It is, fatig it, it is fatiguing. It is, it, there's a lot of fatigue. You have fatigue which yeah. uh, comes into picture. Yeah, SIPTI did a number of, of studies on this during the 1930s, 1940s, and 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 they found that uh, you know SIPTI would be in motion picture people. They uh, decided that you know you want to make sure that your audience stays and watches a two-hour movie. Okay, so you don't want to piss them off. <laughs> they leave then. Okay, and they, they don't spend any more money. So the idea was they figured out what the best curve was for frequency response, and they figured out. That uh, that uh, localization was very important, so that's why if you look behind the screen of the old screens, you had speakers, you know, spaced almost all the way across the entire width of the screen, and and you would send the sound that you want to that particular speaker. So if the person were talking, it would be at that speaker talking. Okay, so your eyes would go like this, and your eyes want to go where the sound comes from. So, uh, so the idea here is if you're if you're 
building a room to listen to things that are spatially important. You want to make sure the room supports uh, uh, diffusion based upon a geometric uh, reflector or redirector. So, Ron, can I? that's coming back again to um, localization that you spoke about. Spoke about, right? Yes. Yes. Now, here, here's a question. I mean, we as humans have our ears, which uh, is <laughs> an idea where sound is coming from in the front of us. Can we uh, use the same localization when the sound originates from behind our head? Or from yes. Above okay. our head? Yeah, you're, you're right in one respect. And that is our ears set up where our sound comes from. You're wrong in the fact that it's just in front. It, it helps in the front, yes, because our ears pointing slightly forward. But in reality, it's a horizontal uh, area. So, so anything that's in the horizontal around your head, your ears pick up quite nicely and determine where they are in space. And yeah, above vertic vertically, vertically, and, and, and like this, it doesn't work very well. That's why you put speakers way up here, and it sounds like it's right out here. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, um, you, you don't. Um, your, your your ears do not determine vertical distance very well. Okay, or vertical localization. Mm -hmm. Then all you keep asking questions. Ron, I know. In, uh, in continuation with the uh, redirection of sound, say we're talking about the ray acoustic region. Say you have a flat surface angle at a particular angle to the incident sound. Will that uh, flat surface also redirect sound? Of course. Of course it will. Yeah. Yes. So, then, yeah. That, yeah. So, in, so in that case, say we have uh, flat surfaces at the first reflection points angled at a certain direction we will be able to redirect the first reflections to some other space instead of the yes, main you, space, right? Yeah you, can, yeah, you can do that, no trouble at all. That's yeah. one of the things we do all the time is anything that, you have to look at the time differential. So mm. if the time is between zero and 20, 20 25 milliseconds, you want to uh, keep that in your area because that increases the intelligibility and that increases mm. the, uh, the localization. Once you go beyond 20, 25 milliseconds, you want to make sure that reflection goes away from you hmm. because that will introduce the effect of a, an echo, which now reduces localization and reduces intelligibility. So in that case, angled walls or splayed walls can also work with a similar effect, right? They can, uh, but again, they, they, they have their own sets of that's the idea uh, behind the, the splay yeah. walls. Yeah. That's the idea behind splay walls, right? I mean, that, that, that's like that. That's going back to the old criteria of of, of a of a fully an untreated room, basically. Exactly. Yeah. An exactly. RFP yeah. room, untreated. You exactly you don't put up treatment. Well, yeah. Keep in mind that at some point inside, you're going to get reflections from other spacings. So if you have something close by that's giving you under 20 milliseconds. A little farther back, you're going to get a reflection from behind you that is 60 milliseconds, and that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a disadvantage to a splayed room or a fan-shaped room, mm -hmm. is you end up with the, the weird reflections from behind you that you don't expect. So, and the problem is you can't make them go away because that reflection could be an early reflection for somebody in the back. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why rectangular rooms are easier to to predict what's going to happen because now you can calculate all the angles of, of yes. redirection. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank so, you guys. It's, it's, I will be signing off now. <laughs> thanks, no problem, thanks, Karthik, Mars, everyone, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Take care. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, thanks. You know, I prepared a paper with all these charts and stuff and <laughs> we get to it. Yes. Uh, one of the problems, uh, Karthik, is this. This is such a complicated field. Yes that we can have two and a half hour meetings every two weeks for the next uh, six months and still not yes. cover the same stuff. <laughs> I was yeah. just I, I was just going to allude to that because, uh, yeah, this is a, a very, very uh, never ending kind of a field, uh, a topic, because I think uh, for once uh, the, the research is quite contemporary and uh, there's a lot of complicated, uh, uh, let's say, science and uh, in specific, the physics Concepts. behind it. So, mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah, and we still haven't figured yeah. out where to place the speakers yet, <laughs> John. <laughs> Our yeah. home theater is still not designed. <laughs> Ron, Ron is really next uh, time. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> Sighing, yeah. <laughs> next time, John, we, you're going to complete the theater. <laughs> next, next time, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll finish we, we it up. Speak our okay. Sorry, John. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. What, what, one of the problems here is you deal with the building blocks of what John is building. Right. And if you don't understand the building blocks, it's hard I to agree. build a building. Right. Exactly. Very, very, very about what these things do. And the thing is, when you put them in your room, you have to know what you're doing. You know, right. well, we'll just put this up here and, and hope for the best. You got to know what they're doing. And yeah. that's, that's the important part. There's no percentage of, of absorption versus diffraction. There's You, you got to know what you're trying to do in there. And you know what this thing does and this thing does. So you put it here and you want this effect. So you do that. And then you, you know, et cetera. Um, yeah. It's basically a never-ending series of fixes. I agree. Well, well I, I, I always I always like to uh, I use this terminology. So uh, acoustics is all about multi-constraint optimization. So each and every case, <laughs> each and every case is uh, is unique, and so it has yeah. to be analyzed. It has to be analyzed in that uh, respect. And I think you, yeah. we got to give uh, respect to that uh, aspect that each and every case is unique in itself and. Uh, uh, what applies to uh, like the, the famous saying, uh, like what uh, what could be poison for someone could be uh, uh, good for something someone else. Yeah, yeah. John. True. John is that John is an expert at small room acoustics. Okay, uh, I don't claim to be an expert at small room acoustics. That's not my field. My field is large room acoustics. Okay, and my field is materials and how they work inside of a space. Period. I don't care how big it is or how small it is. It's still the same physical principles. Exactly. And so, exactly. so you have to have both sides of this. And that's why this particular format that we're doing right here is actually, to me, is very interesting because there's a lot of ways of learning here. Mm -hmm. And but it, but it means cardiac that you know we may be doing a couple more of these along the way on diffusion and other stuff besides. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and John needs to finish this. Right. And not even not, reach the mo the we've not even reached the most important question. How many subwoofers? One of each pressure. All you points. need is an <laughs> eight inch three thousand watt subwoofer. Oh, yeah, that's all you need. Fifty inch. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing oh, because Ron and no, I were no, talking okay, about that. But, okay, you 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 just jump you just jumped in something that you, you, you I know, it's like I just, a quick quick damn <laughs> uh, uh, Mars, just just so you're aware, uh, I I I actually participated in a, a DARPA research project on using sound as a weapon. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. This goes back to the nineteen fifties. Oh. Okay. We made a speaker that was around uh, twenty feet in diameter. Oh. You don't know about the LRAD, are you? Oh yeah, I, I tested the LRAD. I know all about LRAD, so I can tell you all about it. But okay. but let's go to this first one. This one was intended to run at around two and a half hertz. Oh. Wow. Okay, and it had about a hundred thousand watts of power pumped into it and the idea here was that two and a half hertz three hertz is a point at which the cell structure walls rub against each other mm. by vibration and in doing so they liquefy wow so wow. if you take the wall structure of a cell and, and liquefy it what happens to the cell well finished nice. my goodness yeah, it becomes liquefied right it's like Ebola okay. mm. which is going to kill you mm -hmm. okay that was the idea here was to be able to use this weapon on the battlefield and liquefy the cells of your of your enemy. But at mm -hmm. two and a half hertz, it won't it be omnidirectional and liquefy your own own soul. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is called military intelligence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, okay. It is highly it's highly uh, confidential. Okay. Yeah, well, what's interesting here is they built this thing. And and they put two guys out there with a set of earmuffs on, okay, to, to run it, and they turned it on. Well, I'm sorry, sound doesn't care whether you're the enemy or the, who you are. Exactly. It's going to liquefy you. <laughs> <laughs> so these two guys liquefied on the spot. Shit, really? Oh yeah, they just died. They did <laughs> like this, right. and they couldn't. They couldn't figure out how to turn it off because they had the control of it where these two guys were. They couldn't go in because anybody going in would die. Yes. Wow. 
So, so they ended up having to figure out how to cut the power to that thing by cutting the main power cables mm-hmm. yeah. coming from from Boulder Dam. That's where they were originally coming from. Wow. And 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 as soon as they got it turned off, somebody went, you know, maybe this is not such a good idea after all. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the earbuds don't protect you from liquefying, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so but, that but- that. That was a project. That was a project. That I, I, read, uh, I don't know if you know of Tom Danley. He's also. Oh, I, I, don't, I know Tom very well. Tom's, Tom's working on something similar using a directed uh, sub energy uh, using his, uh, what's that, uh, um, uh, tapped, tapped horn subwoofer technology. Okay. Just, just, just for a history lesson. Okay. Tom Danley's tapped horn is, is based upon the co entrant horn that was invented by Ralph Heinz. Okay, about 10 years before that. Okay, so that was a copycat situation. But again, there's so few speakers sold. If you talk to Ralph about it, he will say, what's the use of going after uh, uh, patents? Because you're not going to get enough out of it to uh, do it. So they they let it go. So you're aware, uh, you brought this up, Kardec. Uh, That was LRAD. Mm. Okay. LRAD was derived from a speaker system that was designed for home stereo, which was a, a panel, a glass panel, that was vibrated in such a way that it provided a sound coming from the surface of it based upon uh, various phase functions of the vibration. Okay, so it would give you a very closed in, like a laser thing. So if you walked in front of it, you could hear the sound. If you walked either side of it, it was gone because it was focused right at you. And it, what it was was a, a, a carrier of about 60K hertz mm. that carried the ad, the analog on top of it, kind of like an AM radio wave, mm-hmm. okay? that type of thing, or FM, maybe it was AM, you know, it was AM. So mm. that's what they were designed for, and they, they produced these things, and, 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 and they were sold very well at the, uh, at the high uh, fidelity markets. Uh, very nice. They, they didn't have very good base response, but they had really nice focus stuff. So from that was derived a company called LRAT. They renamed it, and, and that was uh, used as a communications device between ships on the ocean. Mm. So right. it was, it was a whole bunch of... I never knew it was used as a communication device. I thought it was used as a, a suppressor for riot. No, it, it was originally designed as communications. It was, it was it was something you could aim because it had a hundred uh, uh, sources lined up by a hundred sources. Oh, it's, okay. It's like a it's so like you, a line line source. No, a line no. source in both directions. In both mm-hmm. directions, yeah, the two dimensional, yeah. uh, two right. It's a hexagonal. Yeah, and, and, and the drivers were one inch. Dome drivers are actually hard drivers. So, uh, so th- that is something. This th- so there are many companies right now doing that. So you have a you have a, a German company which is called uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Marzi uh, Kushru recently alluded to that. Right? Oh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's, a number of con- there's a number of con- companies doing this, but it was yeah. it was originated by LRAD. It's called it's called Holoplot. So there's a company yeah. in Germany which is doing that Holoplot. Yeah, which is basically directing the sound towards a focused yeah. audience. Yeah, well, in this situation here, the the original unit was about two foot by two foot. Right. Okay. And it was used to create a beam that you could aim at another ship right. about right. Uh, five or 6,000 yards away. Yeah. Okay. A long way away. Right. And the idea here was that you could, you could focus these things down so tight that you could focus it using a laser beam on a person. Right. So right. the laser beam would, would illuminate the person, and that person could hear what was being said, and nobody on either side of them or anywhere right. on the ship could hear anything else. Right. That very, was the very, idea. Very, very focused and, uh, aiming. Right. And you can't intercept it. Right. right. Okay. That, that means now you have, uh, you have communication between ships that can't be intercepted by radio waves or anything else. So right. it's very secret. Okay. And that's right. what it was designed for. So that they, they they designed it eventually where you could do as long as you can see the the, the uh, line of sight to the person you're going right. to, you right. can communicate up to ten miles away. Wow, right. ten miles. Okay, right. yes, and you could talk back and forth as long as you had this, right. this thing focused each other. Right. Uh, so somebody decided, well, what happens if instead of using voice, 
you put in a two uh, two k four k hertz warbling sound. Mm -hmm. You go dee, 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 like this, you know, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you aim it at somebody, and you boost it up power wise to each of these drivers to the point where you got one hundred and sixty two dB. Holy shit! Okay, mm -hmm. it would become really irritating. In fact, mm -hmm. it would burst your eardrums, mm -hmm. and it would it would it would it would make you kind of writhe around on the ground in pain. Because you'd be bleeding right. from your ears. Yeah, okay. you'd bleed from your ears. Mm. So these were called non-lethal weapons. But yes. wouldn't, wouldn't the inverse square law apply to these kind of speakers? So, I mean, once you double distance, you're going to drop six dB, won't you? Well, that's what. Not... Yeah, that's why the line array does things. Exactly. It's like laser. This is like a laser beam. Mm -hmm. Does does the inverse square law apply to the laser as it does the light? No, 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 because no. it is focused. Right. Okay. So you don't lose the energy that way either. And and so what they did is they created these things to be uh, eight foot by eight foot instead of two foot by two foot. You had longer range. Okay. And it would maintain that 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 focus and stuff. So doing that, now you have created a weapon that can be trained on somebody that doesn't kill them but makes them wish they were dead. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <laughs> and 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 they were mounted on board ships for anti piracy. Right. So, right. and that came all out about the uh, Somalia area and, and stuff mm. like that. So, instead of carrying guys on board with guns, they mm. would have these things that were mounted on pivots. And as soon as the pirates would come up, they'd flip them down and turn it on and make that pirate wish he was not there. Right. Okay. So that's why you don't hear as much about piracy now as you used to, is because mm. we can we can uh, we can basically decommission this person for the period of right. time he's around in that area. You want to get out of there. So yeah, kind of they, like, the, it, 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 like the electronic insect uh, uh, things that keep the yeah. insect away. <laughs> so, so, so they so they built these to be like five foot diameter round focusing things. They put them on uh, like uh, police weapons or police police vehicles, and you can aim them at a crowd of rioters, and you can pick out one or two people who are leading the rioting and focuses at them. And makes them go want to go away. Now, the people around them are not affected. I think, person, Ron, I think, Ron, uh, we are touching on uh, sensitive technology. I think it's best left uh, unspoken about. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, actually, it's very well known. Yeah, it's uh, true. But so, yeah. so, so well, the, next, yeah. the next thing, yeah, the next thing they did is they changed the frequency drivers right. to RF drivers. Oh, right. Okay. And they produce RF fields that now impinge upon your skin. And cause heat. And and well, they don't heat. What they do is they activate the pain sensors. Oh. You don't actually get heated up. You don't get warm. But it makes your skin think that your skin is on fire. Wow. Right. And that's how they do crowd control now. Is they mm -hmm. aim at people and they go, do you want to feel like you're, you're on fire and laying on the ground? Probably not. You want to get out of there. So they right. get out. And they, and they can focus on a person at a distance of three or 400 yards. Mm -hmm. And make that person want to get out of there, and the rest of the people don't even know what's going on. Absolutely, so extremely is, target, extremely targeted. Um, yeah, actually, when we when we did, when we did our measurements, we actually measured how far this thing would go. It would produce a level of 162 dB, two uh, K, four K, at a distance of almost two miles. Whoa! Seriously, wow. 162 yeah. dB at two miles. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it sure pissed off a lot of people, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Imagine. But, yeah, we've we, we measured all this stuff at our facility. Wow. And, and I can tell you that uh, the guys who are doing this for years have been doing this. They know what they're doing. Uh, uh, I, I don't usually talk about this a whole lot, but our laboratory does a lot of DARPA work, uh, the, the defense uh, group. And there's a lot of things out there that people don't know about uh, that – they really don't want to know about. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. <laughs> Carton, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I understand what I said. Uh, there is... Uh, Keith has got his hand. Raise his hand uh, for quite some time. So, Keith, uh, you want to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, from your side? Sure. Thanks uh, for having me. I had a question for John, but uh, happy to hear if Ron has anything to say about this as well. Um, a while ago, John and I were talking, and he had mentioned and even showed me imagery of... Uh, a studio he was designing with a uh, a bass trap in the floor under the speaker mixing area to help with uh, some of the um, 
speaker boundary issues. I was just curious if John is still oh, doing right. that in his practice or. Oh, or I, I, I have designs for that. I'm waiting for somebody who can afford to do it. It's, uh, I, use do a, it. I use a steel grating on the floor and under, under that are anechoic wedges that refuse to allow any reflections out. So what it does, you get speaker bounce no matter where you're at. Even if you have flush mounted speakers, it's going to hit the floor. It's going to bounce up. If your desk is there and blocking it, that helps. However, you're still getting that elsewhere. Um, that's why I invented the, the diffraction desk, the Borg uh, mixing desk system for, for in the box working. Um, the, uh, but the floor bounce is, is a concern to some, and that's a solution. We'll see. So I know so Tom Hidley. Use the home theater solution, put a carpet on the floor. No. <laughs> that, that will, that'll cut that's, the reflection at, at about 2K. <laughs> 2 kilohertz. Yeah. It, it, but the low frequency, the lower frequencies, uh, then affect it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like you need a carpet 10 feet thick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, if you if you if you, uh, if you look at the picture of my arc, you'll see the wedges on the floor around the arc. They're five foot wedges. Holy whoa! Okay. Okay, and and they cover the all, all the area for all measuring, so that way the floor doesn't give you a reflection when you're measuring. But I had to have five foot uh, five foot tall wedges to do that, and they. The yeah, it covers an area of about 10 degrees on either side. Uh, uh, so, John, uh, if you're doing that in the studio, you mean the studio floor is raised up by five feet? Is No, it's not raised. Oh, it's dug down? Five oh, feet? yeah, we got to, we got, we dig a hole. Okay. <laughs> we dig a hole. <laughs> we dig a hole. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. Yeah, we can put a grating over the top of it, so you just walk across it. It's not a big deal. But yeah. under there are the wedges. That's yeah, or, or or I can imagine right now if I was talking to John, I would say, John, just make a two story uh studio and yeah. put the bottom, the, the uh, just leave a hole in the floor to the bottom floor room exactly. and then put the wedges down there. The little but, wedges. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and here's, now, now we've got another problem we got a windowing happening, so we got a <laughs> reverberate room downstairs and we got this grid thing coming up, so it's windowing everything back up into our mixing room and. And we're screwed again. <laughs> yeah, this is what happens when you have way too much time to imagine things. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, do you have do you have any of those uh, of those uh, pictures that the guy from Egypt put together for the uh, the recording studio I do. In, I do. in Saudi Arabia? Okay, yeah, I once do. you bring up. Why don't you bring up one of those the performance room and the recording room with the uh, glass front? Okay, just a second. I gotta, I gotta uh, get over there. Oh, let's see. Um, so while goes. you're talking, while you were looking, uh, we were talking about the, uh, the measurements we did with those spine walls, with the curved mm -hmm. walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. You're gonna see how they were used in this situation. And in this situation, we have a recording studio where the entire front wall is solid glass. And the speakers are mounted in the glass wall. Oh wow! Flush. <laughs> I hear somebody laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are these are the renders. Okay. We I don't have right. photos yet, but these are the renders. This is the control room. Uh, this is looking from the tracking room into the control room. Oh, that's amazing! I have a glass front wall. Speakers hung in the, in the wall. This is from the other side, looking at the tracking area. Um, this is the, this is that wall right here, that uh, oh. spline. This is a, a, what I call an optimized spline. It's based on a, on a prime, uh, or a primitive root sequence. Is it and, only in one dimension or is it, uh, is it splined in the second, uh, dimension also as in the horizontal, like, so does it from top to, from ceiling to floor, is it also having different, no, uh, no, 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 no okay. No. Okay. No, it's uh. Let's see. Where am I? Oh, this and this. Ah, oh, here it is. Okay. So no, it goes in and out. You know, right. it's just flying it going in and out. It's like a snake on the wall. Right. Yeah. 
So this, the idea here was to try to unite the performing space and the recording space in such a way that you felt like you were in the room with them. It definitely yeah. does that. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 if you look at the cur if you look at the wall of the glass wall, it's a two layer wall. One is flat on the side of the performance, and the other side is curved. Oh, it's curved. I thought it'd be two yes. Okay. Yeah, this yeah. side you you can see you can barely see the edge here, right here on the floor. Oh, now yeah, this yeah. is a render, mind you. Mm -hmm. uh, this goes here, and it's got a seam right about here. I think you can see a little bit something here. Same way over here, there's a seam here. And these are angled from the plane, from the flat plane in front of you. They're angled in 25 degrees. You're right. Okay. So there's three, three different pl plates of glass. Yeah, there's three different plates of glass here. On this side, uh, hello, this side, flat. there's one, one piece. And it yeah. creates the... Uh, you, can, you can see this uh, on the floor. You can see the the, the angles, the splays. Yes. Yeah, right. There you, yeah, there you go. Yeah, and and the whole point here is is in order to make it soundproof, you had to have a lot of space in between. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so the the actual wall thickness at the center is around thirty inches. Oh, 30 inches! Wow. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. This is a very very thick, and the glass itself is one inch laminated glass. Mm -hmm. Yes, e each layer of it. So there's multiple layers of this stuff. So. It's a very, very expensive proposition to do this, especially when you cut holes in the in the glass to mount these speakers, and they and they're mounted on on resilient type channels and stuff, so they don't vibrate, and and they're and they're and they're resiliently mounted in the glass, so they don't vibrate the glass and all kinds of stuff. Did yeah. they actually build this? Did they build it? Yes. <laughs> according, according to the guys I talked to, they actually built it, and they are extremely happy with it. Okay. Um, and it's really but exciting. but they also had they also had a budget of around a million dollars to do this. Mm. Exactly. And yeah. this is in Saudi this is Saudi Arabia, a place called Jeddah. Mm, Jeddah. Yeah. yeah. So that's where this is at. And it's a it's a college <laughs> where they teach people how to run sound and stuff. Yeah. But but yeah, Pretty John cool. and I John and I uh, worked together on this project, and uh, so uh, this is a situation where. Uh, I had some ideas, he had some ideas, and we, the two of us together came up with this thing, and, and, and it was, it's one of the more, what do you call it, uh, more forward-looking uh, studios that we've ever designed or I've ever designed, and uh, so we, we tried a lot of different things, <laughs> and it, it took us, what, about six months to design this thing? Uh, to get it done, about six months, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Take yeah, some time because so. we went through the the soundproofing. We special uh, spe these special studs by Sta uh, Sa Safeco, mm -hmm. Scafco, Scafco, yeah, and uh, yeah, special materials, all kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah. we every every trick that we know in the book that's available mm -hmm. to us, we use <laughs> in this room. <laughs> wow. That's what you do every time when I when I design a place. I I, I pull up the most uh, current stuff that I know, and what works, and what we need. What do we need? We'll put it here. Uh, was this uh, was this project uh, funded by the? Evolving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was this uh, project funded by the government of Saudi Arabia, yes. or was it? The, yes. Okay. Yeah, and and there's actually this room, and there was a performance hall as well. Mm. And yeah, I don't know. Who did the performance hall? Did they finish that? Did he say? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, they, they're still working on that. But but this is the place I was telling you about where we took the ceiling. And we use a lot of partial sphere sections and put partial them on the ceiling. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we covered that along with the walls. We did that on the walls as well. We call and partial yeah. sphere sections in India, we call them gamelas. We use them <laughs> to carry sand and cement. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Inverted, right? There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea here is we're trying to share with everybody here what works. It, 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 and it means you have to change a lot of times what you think works versus what really does work. Right. And, and and that's one reason why this this particular thing you're doing, Cardig, is so important. Because, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to other guys that, are, that are, have been here before and, and been participated, number one. They want to know if you're going to post this on, on YouTube. And I said, as far as I was aware, you were. And the next question was, when are we having the next one? Exactly. <laughs> 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 so, 
So, yeah. you know, we could keep you busy for a number of months doing this, <laughs> you know, and I don't think we'll ever cover the same things over and over because there's so many things, so especially many. in the area of, of absorption and diffusion that can be covered in here. And we can have a two hour session or three hour session on just certain types of diffusers. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, I think, and, that, and would I think be, that would be a great next session if, you, if you're up to it, you know. Different uh, well, diffusion. John, John, yeah. well, that's what that's what John and I have talked about along the way, and and but, the more we but do, Ron, these you things, know, the what, what I would would appreciate is if we could come up with a little bit more scientific, like you know, share some formulas and and papers and and talk uh -huh. about how you got around to it that way. Uh, I will tell you this: I was going to do two papers, in one in Torino and one in Tokyo. Uh, on this absorption thing, and I had to cancel it because I can't afford to do those trips. They're too expensive. Uh, going from here to Torino was roughly around $4,000 for the airline fares. Going to Tokyo was around $4,000. Mm -hmm. And this entire place is supported on my Social Security and whatever I make testing, which is never enough to quite to cover all the costs. So I had to cancel both those. I'm still planning on coming to to uh, Sydney, Australia in December for ASA mm -hmm. to present a paper on this. And I'll be presenting that. But to be honest with you, I have all these formulas and I can pull them up. I don't have them right here in front of me right now, but I can pull them up and we can have them for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Kardec, you're asking about the integrals. Uh, this includes all those, the, these formulas. Right. For doing awesome. absorptions, awesome. okay, and diffusion. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do in this situation other than show the actual GLLs now. Right, yeah, that, that'd be this, great. What, that'd be great. You know, that gives an yeah. idea of what's actually so. Happening. So, in that case, John, probably the best thing to do is we can schedule something where we can take your 604s and your 511s and stuff, and we can uh, we can put them on to Speaker Lab, and I can show them and go through the process like I did with you. Yeah. Yes. Um, that would be good. You know what? I, I could I could load up uh, uh, one of those diffusers you sent me a long time ago that you tested there, and we can show during the conversation. I can put it on my screen and say, and you say, okay, now do this and show this. Okay, do that. Do and that. we could just do that. Yeah. Guys, do we have a few more minutes? Sure. Okay. Maybe we're going to uh, – John, to be honest with you, why don't you show the 604-1? Uh, the Six oh four dash one. The one I just sent you. Yeah, um, six oh four. Okay. Oh, now, uh, yeah, six oh four is great. All right. So, so here oh, it six, is. Six oh six oh four dash one, not six oh four. Oh, the, did you? You didn't send me the dash one. Yes, I sure did. Uh, this was the five eleven you called. Uh, that's uh, that's the third one I sent you, but that would be fine too. <laughs> well, I missed it. Oh, this is uh, this is that I'm thinking was uh, for the other one. But here, this, this is that's the, the that's the five eleven. That's the five eleven uh, dash one, or yeah, the five eleven. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So either case, so this is what comes up from you know, from Speaker Lab. You saw a picture of it, and you now see that it, from the front, it's variable depths and stuff, uh, etc. Okay, now. Uh, John, go up to where the calc it shows calculation. Uh huh. And do calculate balloon. Okay. And now set that for five degrees. Okay. Five set degrees. it for four meters. Just type in four meters. Okay. Okay. Go down and take the check mark out of the uh, air absorption. Okay. And put and put the control up there at AEF broadband. All right. Okay. Okay. And hit okay. Oh, nice. fantastic. <laughs> okay. So now you can now see what it's going to do. Uh, let's see if we, John, you're going to have a thousand hertz. Yeah. This is a thousand hertz. Now go up oh, to the let top. Me go to third it. octave. Let me go yeah, to go third, third octave. octave. Okay. okay. So there's third octave. Now set it up for do, do an alternate Y. Alternate O. Oh. Um, and on, the, on your, key, on your keyboard, no, alt, key alt Y. Oh, right. okay, yeah, yeah, alt Y. Okay, okay. So, so now you're looking right down the gut of this thing, and and what you can see is the sound is coming in from the center, 
and it's coming back out of the center, which means this is basically a spectral reflection coming back mm -hmm. right back at you. Mm -hmm. So this level that you're seeing here, uh, the white is no uh, attenuation of any kind. The red is anywhere from three to six dB mm -hmm. attenuation. And as you go down on the on the uh, on the thing on the side, uh, you can see the delays along the way. So, uh, John, you're going to have to become the uh, the presenter again uh, yeah. in order to come up because it's uh, coming up right now. Oh, okay, I'm, no, I'm here. Can you there see this? Go. Yes. Everybody so, see this. <laughs> so now what you can do is go up here to the top where it has frequency. To the top. Yeah. Click that and then re-click it. And now use your arrow down or up keys to go upward. Okay, we're going up to uh, 1.25K, 1.6K, uh, 2 kilohertz, uh, 2.5, uh, 3, 4. Yep. Now, we're starting to get something at 4, 5. Yeah. See, it's starting to spread horizontally. There yes. you are. This is where maximum effectiveness is. At 6.3, okay. bam. So, so leave, leave it there at 6.3. Okay. okay. Now hit Alt-Z. Alt-Z. Hmm. This is along the Z axis. Now we're, this yeah, is... now we're looking, the Z axis is looking down on it. Mm -hmm. So now you can see the coverage in a horizontal plane. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Plan, so the plan view. Have, plan view. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. so now you can see that it covers... Wow. All almost 100, uh, what, 150 degrees wide. Mm -hmm. Pretty okay. good. And if you notice the colors, it's barely down. It's only down 3 to 4 dB, 5 dB down from the original sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a reflector. Okay. Yeah. So now if you look at the green, that is down 20 dB. You're not even worried about what's in there. Okay. So now take it to a, a X view. So we do Alt-X. So now we're looking at it from the side. Mm -hmm. So you can so see there's hardly open. any vertical diffraction at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's strictly because horizontal. Our, yeah. And that's what it's designed for. Is to, so now do, um, do, an alt, do an alt three now. Now take the uh, take the slider bars on the bottom and, and slide the, the bar around. And we can look at it. And if you want to take the slider bar on the side, the right side, it take it changes it the in the vertical view. You can tilt it, yeah, tilt it up and down. So the the, the way you've got this is you you've actually measured this and then uh, exported yes. it to oh, okay. Yes. This is this yes. is an actual measurement. Okay, it's the data from an actual measurement. Now, whoops, what happened? Where did it go? Wait, um, where did it go? It died. It died. Ron, it died. It, no, it died. It? No, I didn't. Oh, there it is, right there. It, it just right died. There. I know. Okay. I have to reset. I have to reset. Well, it, yeah. If if you try to if you try to move it too fast, it won't redraw uh, fast enough, and it'll it'll crash. So set uh, it for four, four, yeah, four four meters again, uh -huh. and then get rid and get rid of the air absorption, and okay. calculate it again. Now, what I want to do is I want to go to the graphs now. Resolution, yeah, fine. Okay, we're going to go there. We're going to okay. go to so uh, go back okay. to six point. Yeah, go back to six point three. It doesn't matter. You go to six point three. Oh. So go up, go up to the top up here where it says graphs. Okay, uh, one second, one second. It won't uh, matter. It won't matter. Oh, okay. Uh, graphs. Go up, go up to graphs. Okay, uh -huh. and and go down to uh, the uh, horizontal map. Uh, two down or so. Why can't I see it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Horizontal map. Now, uh -huh. now do do Alt Z, Alt Z, Alt Z. Okay. okay. Now you're gonna you're gonna have to bring us back up. So if you look at this, this is the coverage of the entire balloon laid out in a flat map. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So if you look at it from the left side, it's low frequency at around 25 hertz. Uh -huh. And if you go to the right side, it goes out to 20k. And and what you're looking at horizontally or vertically is the coverage. Uh, you're John. I have to bring you back up again. Yeah, so right here, right here. Okay, so, sorry. Thank so, you. So so what's happening here is you can see here at about 125 hertz or so, it covers all the way across, which is basically three, you know, 200 or 180 degrees. 
you look over in the side here, you can see the coverage on the side. Okay. So as you change yeah. in frequency, as you go towards the right, you can see the coverage patterns change uh, yeah. over on the right on the right hand side. So this is a view of the horizontal coverage of this thing laid out in all frequencies at the same time. Now do the vertical map. Mm -hmm. no. John, go, go yes, ahead. vertical map. Sorry, yeah, just go. Just hit, just hit vertical map. Vertical. Sorry. Okay. So this is the vertical uh, map. Okay. You accept that you got to do all Z, all Z again. Okay, there you there go. So now you can see vertically, it doesn't do very much uh, mm -hmm. except the low frequency. And as you get higher up, it, it narrows down to just maybe five, 10 degrees vertical. Yeah. Not a lot. Okay. So that's, that's a way of displaying that, that balloon in a flat map. See. Okay. So now let's go up to that, uh, calc uh, that graph again. And go down to uh, the uh, uh, what is it? The uh, beam width. Beam width. Here we go. Go, go to horizontal. Horizontal. Okay. Okay. So what you're looking at here is the area that is blue doesn't count in this unit. Mm -hmm. And here's here's why. It's a two foot by two foot unit. Do you honestly think you're going to see it at 125 hertz? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not really yeah so so what you're looking at in the uh john you're back you, you've yeah, got I'm, off I'm, here okay, i'm here yeah it so, doesn't so so that's why we blocked it out you're not using this area okay what's usable here is from about 3k or 2k whatever it is here i can't read the numbers up uh, to around john, john can you just uh, maximize your screen john um maybe share your screen again john it is, i am sharing it i yeah, am yeah. sharing it here now so. now it's better it, now, now it's okay, okay. You, you uh, want to pin pin my pin my screen right now, Kartik? Yeah, just one moment. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. If you just pin it, then it, then yeah, I won't I've, I've done that. Okay. Okay. So so you can see that we're doing coverage here of about, uh, and I can't see your numbers, John, because they're so. It says five k, five k right here. It's five k right? to sixteen k here. You're still not pinned. Really, it just uh, it just pinned as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I have pinned uh, John's. Uh, yeah, I have pinned John's uh, screen. Yeah, huh. I see your face. Okay, you see my face now. Yeah, no, I, I see your what face now. What about this? What about okay. this? Do you see this? I see it now. Yes. Okay. okay. So now, if you look from here, which is around twenty degrees or so, I think it is, 15, 20 degrees over here on the right, right hand left side. If it goes yes. up, it goes up to around 120 or 130 uh, degrees at the peak at around 4K there. Yeah. Look off, about... look off to your left. You can see the... Oh, the, here. The, the, well, yeah. no, the left, all the way to the scale. Scale all the way to the left. Okay, all the way that'll to the scale. You, that, that'll tell you how many degrees of coverage it has. So uh -huh. if, you go, if you go to this peak over here and go back here, you can see it's around 90 or 100 degrees or so at yes. 4K. And at 8K or 12K, it's a little bit higher than that. So, so this gives you at least an idea horizontally what kind of coverage you have over what frequency range. Right. Okay. Now go the graph and do the uh, the beam width vertical. Beam width vertical. There we go. So vertically, we have little to nothing. Hardly anything. We have. That's exactly data. it. Yeah. Okay. So now you can you can also compare this. Go to your your graphs again, and go to the polars, uh -huh. and pull up the polars and set the okay. polar frequency at 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 four k. Uh, a quick question here, Ron. What would be the angle of incidence of uh, the sound on all the screen? all these have an angle of incidence of around three degrees. Oh, three degrees. So yeah. if, uh, and that's why we are not getting much vertical uh, dispersion, but if we had an angle of incidence of say 30 degrees, then would that uh, raise the vertical dispersion? Well, you'll see the dispersion go up, but the level will be 20 dB down. Oh, okay. okay. So this is why I say we, we've done experiments where we've, we've done the, uh, the angle of incidence going from zero to 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And we, we found that really the only usable data came out of between zero and 15 degrees. All right. And the, and the difference in there was so minimal that you really just could, you could pick out a, uh, an angle that was like three or four or five degrees. No, so you got some horizontal movement. But that's great because then you're not firing any energy either into the floor or into the ceiling. That's exactly it. Right. Okay. So, 
So th this took a, it took us about a year of experiments to figure out where was the ideal uh, incident angle to get the maximum uh, information that we could use. Mm -hmm. And we found that was between zero and five degrees. So this and has to be placed on the wall at a certain height from the tweeter of the speaker. Uh, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know, it's, yeah, sound coming in will go through here at an incident. And it, again, if it, if it comes in, it's kind of, any kind of incident between zero and 15 degrees, it's going to give you about the same results. Anything beyond that, it, you're not going to have enough energy to worry about measuring. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so okay. back to our, our picture there. If you'll notice it's 4, what, 4K or whatever it is. This is 4K. Right, I so now it. you can see the vertical and horizontal overlaid. So oh, you can see the difference. Which, which, is, which is horizontal? Blue is? Uh, uh, yeah, blue is vertical and red is horizontal. Red is horizontal, okay. So these are standard polars. Mm -hmm. Very we understandable. Where it really starts working is 6.3K. You see how it there you go, see? right there. See? Mm -hmm. uh, go up to, yeah, go up to 12K. And then eight, and then we, it drops back down. Then twelve k, it pops up again. See? Yep. Okay. So, so this is a way of, of displaying this stuff that people who use speakers can understand quite nicely. Because this is how you describe a speaker polar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So that's why I say we can we can use this just like we do a speaker, and and we can put this on the wall, and it will act like this with the sound coming off the wall. So there's all these capabilities here. Frequency-wise, uh, John, go up to, up to yeah. the graphs again. Graphs. Okay. And, and go down to, I think it's the, uh, uh, you have to go above, go up. I, I can't read the thing. Um, yeah. Keep going. One more, one more, one more. There you go. Uh, no, one more. No, oh, transfer function? Yeah, transfer function. Okay. Okay. There is mm -hmm. the frequency response uh, on frequency axis. Works. Hmm. Phase overlaps. Yeah, uh, there's phase and magnitude both. So the red is the uh, is the uh, frequency, response. Uh, frequency response and magnitude, and mm -hmm. now the blue is the phase response. Now, if you look, we had a 360 degree shift flip. at at at, at, uh, flip at that point, and then it continued yeah, on point. down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you continue, John, again, I, I don't see your graph here. It, it oh, okay. Again. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, here, so it yeah. goes all the way down until you hit around 2K. Mm -hmm. Keeps on decreasing. Now, look at all the flips that occur between 2K and 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 over here to uh, oh, 4K. It's constantly flipping. Yeah. Yeah. Every, and every time the phase flips, this means you're going to hear more of that that uh, openness. That air. That air. That's mm -hmm. right. So that's why you, if you look at this, you can you can almost look at this thing and say, where is it going to work best? It's going to work best between 2K, 2K and 4K and another time period between 8K and about 14K. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is what this particular software allows us to do. And well, space at, flip in the low frequency? What is that? Oh, that's, okay. we're not looking at it, is it? That's the size of the unit. Okay. This yes. is based on those oh, two foot by two foot. That's, that's what that does. It's just a specular reflection off of that whole oh, piece. That's exactly it. So yeah, because so you figure this 500 hertz is the size of the sample. That's the point. And what you're doing, you're seeing a reflection of the plane wave coming off the off the flat surface, and mm -hmm. you're seeing it flip. So that's why it's no use to you because it is a specular reflection. Okay. Okay. So this is the kind of data that we're trying to produce now. Nobody's ever had this for diffusers previous to this, ever. And even if you look at the scattering coefficient, what does that tell you? It tells you there's a certain amount of energy that quote is scattered. It doesn't tell you anything about its characteristics or anything. It's just it's just scattered energy. But isn't yeah. this graph of the phase showing us that there's a huge delay between uh, what's this? I don't know. I can't read that. It's 63 hertz and 2k. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, that's because it's a two by two sample. Okay. So if you have a two by two sample, it doesn't matter what the detail is on the front surface. It's mm -hmm. still a two by two flat plane. No, I'm talking about and, a delay. Delay. There's a delay. Well, it's lagging, right? Well, it's it, there's a phase shift, yes, and that has to do with the fact that you're converting a uh, a curved uh, source 
uh, front okay. uh, plane from a spherical plane. plane understand. That's right, and that's what you're seeing is that is that phase shift in order to change mm -hmm. convert it to a uh, to a, uh, a planar type thing. And then in this and in this section, these are all the planar uh, reflections. Reflections. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it it has a lot of data in here. Uh, John, last one. Uh, go okay. up to graph. Go up okay. to graph and go to uh, phase balloon. Phase balloon. All right. Oh my lord! Here it is. See, it's we're out. at twelve point five kilohertz. Right. So now go back. Go back to one hundred twenty-five hertz. One twenty-five. One hundred twenty-five. Okay. Yep. Point. Now ro rotate that three. Let's just do an alt three. Alt three. Thirty degrees. Okay. Oh, it's just an alt. It's just three D of you. So yeah. what you have is all these these points where they form like a, a, a pedal all the way around. You notice they all stop at the same point. Okay. Those are all phase uh, coherent. functions coherent, that are right? coherent. That's exactly it. So the more it looks like a, a flower petal, the mm -hmm. more coherent the, the information is. Mm -hmm. So John, bring, bring that back up and go up in frequency to, say, 1K. <laughs> See, no, starting, to starting to break up, but it's still a lot of a it's lot of coherency, coherency, coherency here. Right. Still a lot yeah. of coherency. Yeah. So take mm -hmm. take it up to six K now. All right. There we go. Wow. That's now three, you, that's three. So uh, it's starting to look four, more and more like five, a see six K is the porcupine. That's right. The, it looks like 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 a sea urchin. Sea urchin. Sea urchin. Sea urchin. <laughs> okay. And the more spikes you have. The more this sound, this thing is going to sound like a source of space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now go up to twelve k or fourteen k. There's twelve point five. Yeah, so you can see it. It it virtually has a phase change every time you move any angle. So you rotate is... that around if you want to. You can rotate it around. Yeah, I mean it's just like. You know, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and and that's where we can tell whether it's going to give you a diffusive sound or not. This is diffuse, right? This is no no. Yes. Like, well, this yes. is diffuse. Totally diffuse. Mm -hmm. no, this is diffusion. This is diffusion in 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 phase, phase not not in magnitude, in phase. Mm -hmm. And this right. is what your ear responds to. It doesn't respond as well to magnitude as it does phase. And the reason is you have two kilohertz. ears. Well, it's not only that. You have, in magnitude, your, your eardrum is a pressure-sensitive microphone. Mm -hmm. It only responds to magnitude in one ear. Okay? But if you have two pressure microphones spaced in space, mm -hmm. then the arrival of phase arrives at different phases at the pressure point, And therefore, your brain interprets that as a time delay and a difference. Mm -hmm. And that, it, it, uh, that interprets into space. So this is uh, anybody familiar with a microphone company called Microflone? Guys? Sorry. Mm, I'm not. I, I, oh, there's a I company don't... out of Germany. It's called Microflone, F-L-O-W-N. No. I they, they have, well, they have a microphone. It's called a kinetic microphone. It, mm. It's used for measuring velocity, not pressure. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's two different pressure microphones spaced in space, face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. And there's a space between, so right. there's a different time arrival, and it, and there's a software package that takes that time arrival and converts that to a velocity. Ah. So you can tell how a velocity microphone is what it is. That's what you're measuring here is the velocity differential. Could we see the uh, the the magnitude balloon if there is one? I mean, well, well you're seeing that all the time. Uh, go go back balloon. to yeah. Let's let's go back up. Uh, John, go back to the graph. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go to the second second one down. Second. Horizontal map? Nope. Horizontal no, one map. right above that. The one right uh, above that. Continuation balloon. All there right. you go. There. That that is a magnitude balloon. Mm -hmm. This is uh here. If you look over in your right hand side, you'll see how many dB down it is. No, no, I got it. This is what we saw in the AM. Yeah, yeah. Those are the magnitude balloons. So you can see now the magnitude balloon looks very different than the phase balloon does. Totally. And you have to keep both of them into account for your ears. 
because your your one ear by itself hears the magnitude balloon. The two ears together hear the phase balloon. Yep. And your brain <laughs> it, it, it conflates those two together into space. If you look at the if you look at the twelve point five magnitude balloon and the twelve point five k phase balloon, uh, is the is the dispersion different? Because you know, uh, uh, do you have like a dispersion angle in in the phase uh, domain? Uh, well, you only know that it's only 180 degrees. That's the maximum it can be. But there is nothing out there that we have a graph of that describes the, the dispersion balloon in a phase. It doesn't exist yet. No, so like now, what, if you look at this balloon right now, we see uh, if if you rotate it on, on uh, like yeah. we're facing it, you'll see that it yeah. is going all the way 180 degrees, right? From Right. So now, John, go, go to the yeah, graph of the phase balloon right. and hit right. Alt Z. Yeah. Yeah, I just did, yeah. Got it. Okay, yeah. so look, look down on it. That is the dispersion angle of all the uh, uh, phases. Correct. So, But in the frequency uh, domain, we don't, I mean, the magnitude domain, we don't get that much uh, dispersion. That's, uh, well, we get 180 degrees in the mm -hmm. magnitude. Yeah, go back to the magnitude balloon. Uh, get John, the second one down. See, wherever the red is. It's only 150, right? 150 or so. So yeah, there's more dispersion of the phase than there is of the magnitude. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the magnitude, wherever you see red, that's all within 3 dB. Okay. Okay. So if your ear is concerned, you're not going to hear the difference. It's going to sound equally loud at, 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 at on either side, 90 degrees on either side, than it is the center. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's the hard part about realizing here is you're looking at, at attenuation here and your ears cannot really uh, discern uh, uh, anything less than a 3D difference for most, most people. But I look over the phase now. Phase is all over the place. Yeah. Now, I can tell you right now that the reason you don't have these other graphs is because they don't really have any application in speakers, phase and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in our area, they do. So... What we've been told by the people who do the software is as soon as there is a standard in place that describes all this stuff, like ASTM or ISO or whatever, they will then uh, come up with some graphs that, that do the same thing, like polars for phase and give you uh, like the beam width of, of, of the phase response. And then we can say that the higher that, that differential goes, the more dispersion there is type thing, uh, more so, and we can describe all these things. We already, we've already we already done that. We've done this by hand. We calculated where every single point was by hand on an Excel spreadsheet and created yeah. graphs and stuff like that. Yeah. But but they're not going to go through this process of changing their software until there's a market for it. And, and that's what we're creating as we measure things. The more and more units we have measured that are inside this GLL function, the more of a market there is. And all of a sudden, they're looking at this going, well, geez, if 99% of the people out there are looking at, at, at diffusers this way, then maybe we need to create the software to allow them to look at this stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, it's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, sometimes it's the egg, sometimes the chicken. And, <laughs> and, and as other people would say, sometimes the female chicken has to come first. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> So. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think the whole point here is that we're in an evolving area of simulation. And how can we best describe things simulated wise? Uh, there's a gentleman out there, uh, and I, I will name his name, Christian Carvin, who is a great believer in simulations. And I agree, simulations are great. The problem is all simulations derive from data first. And he's kind of going from the other direction. It's like, well, we'll create the data from the simulation. I'm kind of going, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> okay. But so we're trying to convince him that let's get the data first, then we can create the simulations. And he's kind of going, well, let's create the simulations because then we can predict the data. No, you can't predict the data. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, so it's it's that, it's a matter. That single statement has rendered all theoretical physicists obsolete. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think, really, I, I, no. don't think I, I don't think we've related all of them obsolete, but we've sure changed the crap out of them. <laughs> <laughs>
basically everything we've learned for the last 80 years uh, is uh, mm, suspect. <laughs> it has to and it, it must remain so. As yeah. long as it remains so, we search and we look. And that's what we need to do. And we need to keep looking. We need to keep testing and keep looking. Uh, as soon as uh, someone stands up with, oh, I, have the, I have the whole truth and it, the, the, it, I, it's everything and that's it. There's no questioning it. Well, we're in big trouble. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, th I think the key here is all the stuff we're researching right now is stuff that is what's called standard uh, generic stuff. Yeah. No, nobody, nobody in the industry has ever wanted to pay for that research because it doesn't give them an advantage in sales. Mm. <laughs> okay. Company, companies are very profit oriented. It's yeah, like, if it doesn't help do. me increase my profit, we aren't going to do it. So you have to, you have to give it to people like John and I will give John all the credit in the world. Okay. Uh, John, I'm going to tell some people something and you may not, uh, I, you know, I hope I have, you know, you're not going to kill me for this, okay? No, no, it's fine. It's okay. John John has invested well over $26,000 in the last two weeks or three weeks in testing. Okay? Out of his own personal money. So that we have this data like the 706 and these 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 the GLLs you have here. So, you know, you got to give John a, a lot of credit for putting his money where his mouth is. Okay? And and he's 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 already partially committed to increasing that level as well. Although I don't know at what level he's going to stop because it's going to be okay. This is going to bankrupt me at some point. Okay, no, you know, well it, but, it's it's not. I'm going to make it. We're going to make it work. I'm going to. Yeah. We're probably going to do that much again. I'm serious. Yeah. So, and so um, this is all eventually going to go into one of his books on materials. You know, and there may end up being a book on absorptive materials, and there may be a book on diffusive materials. You know, and and you know, we can we can create cut sheets for all these diffusers by just having all these little graphs and stuff and putting them on a cut sheet. And you can actually see what what a diffuser does, and then you can pick your diffuser based, based upon the performance. Correct. Yeah, That's what you way want way it to do. do. That's the yeah. way it should be, right? Yeah, and yeah. and one of the things that happens is. Right now, we pick our absorbers based upon their name. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, I'm or sorry. Or the NRC value, which is the yeah, or the NRC value. And and, and ever oh, since I've been doing modeling uh, with ease, I look at the database and I go, "What do I need an absorber to do?" And then I'll go look at the curves and see if I can find a curve that is the the opposite of what I want. And I'll pick that absorber. I don't care what it is. It could be called Timbuk Two. Okay, it's going to go in there because that 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 that's the material I need, and and that's how I've done my design work is is based upon what I need it to do rather than what the name of it is. In other words, uh, you can have Armstrong Ultima. Okay, great. I don't care about Armstrong Ultima. Now, if it has a nice curve, it does this at the frequency I want, then I will put Armstrong Ultima in that job. <laughs> okay, because that's what it's there to do. But Ron, you know, that's exactly I, what you're trying to do is what what. The speaker companies have done, right? I mean, uh, many people buy speakers just by brand name. Nobody actually looks at curves and stuff and says, oh, this one's maximally flat and this phase response is this way and the frequency response of the speakers. They know it's a BMW, it's a Nautilus. I want it, you know? Yeah, I know. And that's why we, that's why we measure. Sometimes when we measure, people are not happy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> we got <laughs> stories about that. that. <laughs> yeah, you have a whole bunch of people that are unhappy about that. Uh, the reason you see a lot of this data today is because of something that happened about 25 years ago, and I was part of that, okay? Uh, there was a, uh, a convention center in Boston that was put together, and they had all these speakers up in the up in the lid, and they aimed down, and they said, oh, it'll cover this, it'll give you intelligibility like this, it'll do this, it'll do that, it'll do that. And they built the place based upon that design. And when they opened it up, they found out that the, the performance of the speaker system in the room was nowhere close to what they said it was going to be. Hmm. So there was, you know, typical U.S. lawyers got involved. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. The city of Boston sued the uh, contractor who then sued the consultant who then sued the manufacturer of the speaker. Wow. So now you've got to figure out who has the deepest pockets. Okay, and you keep on suing, you keep on suing. 
So I ended up in court finally having to testify. And what it was, was I had measured the speaker and I had sent the speaker measurement to the manufacturer who then had it looked at by their marketing people. Now the speaker itself was marketed as a 60 by 40. When we measured it, it was more like 90 by 70. Oh, okay. okay. But marketing didn't like that. So they forced the people who had the data to change the data so it looked like a 60 by 40. Okay. So when it was put into the program, it acted like a 60 by 40, mm -hmm. which the real speaker didn't do. Okay. So, so, so the performance was predicted wrong to begin with because the data was, was affected fudging. by the manufacturer's marketing department. Fudging, fudging. Yes, yeah, a lot of fudging. So what happened was uh, when I, when I showed the original uh, data, I showed them that it was not 60 by 40, it was 90 by 70. Mm -hmm. And the court went, well, why has it changed? Well, then all of a sudden the company that made this particular speaker, which by the way, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> the company went out of business. Uh, they said, well, you know, our marketing said that this is what it's supposed to be. Well, and the judge said, well, I know what it's supposed to be, but it's not. <laughs> so why didn't you create a speaker that did what it was supposed to do? And, and the engineers didn't have any answer for that. So eventually what happened was the company, the speaker company was found to be liable for this. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, award was like five or $10 million. And that Did bankrupted you? the that bankrupted the company, and Was they went out of business. Community sound? Uh, no, community still exists. No, but I can tell. Bought over by Bayan for them. Oh, it was by it, yeah, but it but still exists. They actually sell community speakers yet. Okay, but no, this was a this was before all the uh, all the buyouts were going on. Uh, uh, let's put it this way: the 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 first letters of the company are A L. Oh, Altec Lenses. Yes, <laughs> you notice there are no more Altec Lansing speakers, okay? They were one yeah. of the old companies that went back to the 1930s. Yes, okay? so, that's bad yeah. management right there. That's what happens when you have an old company, you got new management, and they, they, yep. they, they, make, they make dishonest decisions like that. Well, yeah. what happens is this is when you allow marketing to control engineering. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so what happened it's, was the word got around in the industry that Altec went under because of this uh, this court case. And they all came back to me and said, well, why did you why did you testify in this way? I said, because it was a truth. Mm -hmm. And their comment was, well, what do we have to do to prevent this from happening again? I said, well, my suggestion is you get your speakers measured. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they said, well, it said, who's going to do that? I said, well, there's me, there's Pat, and a couple other guys that can do it. But there's only about three of us in the whole world. Pat from so Sonotcom. Yes, he, he was he was he, he started the whole process of, of doing that, but the problem was he didn't have a way of measuring it, and then there was nobody else that did, so he produced a way. But you know, I find our better our measurement systems are better because we do it simultaneously rather than one at a time. So he has to have a microphone moved to you know to all these three thousand positions, and it takes six hours to measure a speaker, which means it'll change air and stuff like that. We can measure the whole thing in less than three minutes. Okay. Because we do 19 simultaneous measurements at the same time as we rotate, and we do a set of measurements every three seconds. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you can do that very quickly. But, but the point is, is it, uh, it, it forced the other companies to start to be honest about things. And my first company that came to us was a company that uh, still exists. Uh, they were bought out by, I'm trying to remember who in the hell they were bought out. Maybe MSC, maybe or something like that. A company called SoundSphere. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Any of you remember those? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were kind of a joke in our industry because it was like they didn't actually do what they're supposed to do. Well, we got a chance to measure them and we actually showed what they actually do. And they were ugly as anything. They had to be the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. And I sent the data back to the guys at SoundSphere. And I said, are you going to post this? He says, well, he says, yeah. I says, it's not exactly exactly what you think it does he said it doesn't matter he said he said if we post these people are going to know that they're real because they're ugly <laughs> 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 and, and lo and behold they posted these things and they got all kinds of good comments from the consultants mm -hmm. saying yeah we know it's ugly but we know it's real too mm -hmm. you know 
And, and so they got all kinds of good stuff about that. And people bought a lot of these things because they said, yeah, it doesn't do exactly what you said, but it does certain things that are useful for us. And we can use them in certain areas that we can't use in other areas. And therefore, they started selling more of their sound spheres than they used to. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. before, it was, it, was, it was unknown how bad they were. We just knew they were bad. We just didn't know how bad they were. <laughs> but when, as soon as you know what the how bad it is, now you can make the how bad good by right. using them certain ways. And so all of a sudden, other companies started, hey, <laughs> that's, that didn't work out like we thought it was. So all of a sudden, we got buried in measuring speakers for like three years. And we were measuring speakers upon speakers upon speakers upon speakers. And we measured over 600 speakers inside that three year period. Wow. And, and most of them were not very good. <laughs> but what was interesting is the results we got from the consultants. The consultants said, we don't care whether they're bad or good. We can do, we can deal with bad or good. We can't deal with the unknown. Hmm. And so all of a sudden we got all these companies coming to us say, Okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna bother these things ever again. Whatever the data is, whatever it is, as ugly as it is, it's ugly. Okay. Now we put it out there and all of a sudden the consultants came back and said, Hey, it ain't a problem with being ugly. It's a problem with being unknown. Right. And so that's oh, why you yeah. see so many uh, so many databases for ease of the manufactured speakers, because we all they've all learned that consultants will not specify your speaker anymore without e data mm. or 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 uh balloon data and mm. you can have uh, clf as well and you, you, you other, need you other need other to tell that to the chinese though uh, <laughs> yes we know <laughs> we're quite aware of it it took us 10 years to get all the uh u.s and european bigger companies to realize this the chinese have not figured this out yet mm. you know uh so you know uh but as consultants uh, when I was a consultant, and that's all I ever did. I'm sorry, you don't give me data. I will not specify your speaker on a project. Period. Don't even don't even call me. Not even worth the effort. Right. And 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 the more and more consultants that do that, the more uh, people always thought consultants don't have any power because the the manufacturers have the power. Consultants are users. They they don't have any power at all. And I told them, I said, look, if you don't specify their equipment, they don't sell anything. If they don't sell anything, they go out of business. So guess what? You have the ability to say, you don't give me the data I want. You don't get specified. All of a sudden, now there is a, a, a monetary reason for measuring. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, uh, look at the sales loss, you know, say a thousand speakers lost at a thousand dollars a piece. The cost of measuring in 1500 bucks is nominal. And that's when they all started doing this and going, oh, well, yeah, okay. That, that, that's actually not a very bad cost. Uh, effect ratio compared to sales. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to hit the manufacturers where they live, and that's called the dollar or the money, whatever it is, you know, and and, and, and if they see that you're going to lose money, kind of like what's going on with uh, uh, Bush, or I mean, uh, Anheuser-Busch Light, Light Beer. <laughs> it was like, ooh, Okay, we're not going to sell your beer anymore because you did this with this. It's like whatever the reason is. The point is, the people out there do have the ability to make a business really hurt if you if you piss off the general public, they will piss on you. <laughs> you know, and and people don't realize that until they get hit. And it's like well, there's enough sudden, competition in the market that you got to be smart. You got to be. Yeah. You got to do what's right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the people who did this bit Bud Light thing, uh, I don't know if you followed it or not, but they got uh, uh, put on permanent leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, go. they went woke and they went broke. <laughs> yeah. So now they're still trying to recover. And now I guess it's affecting other brands of theirs as well, like uh, uh, the bats and stuff like that. So it's like all of a sudden they're going, okay, this was not a good thing for us to do. Okay. And it was it's one of these things where, you know, uh, does free speech exist? Yes, it does. But nobody said that free speech doesn't encounter uh, blowback. Mm -hmm. okay. consequence. It's consequence and responsibility. That, That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. And so they're, they're, you know, these companies have learned that, that sometimes when you, when you do things for, for what you consider the right reasons, you better be sure that the rest of your people uh, agree with you when you do it. <laughs> 
because if you don't, they're gonna they're gonna blow back at you, and you're gonna lose money. And it's the same way with speaker companies. Uh, you okay. know, company. John, uh, yeah. what time is it at your around at your place? Oh, it's only one a.m. What I was gonna say, <laughs> oh, we, 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 we've been doing this four hours, guys. Okay. It's eleven yeah. thirty out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you need, you need to crash. you can go on forever, Ron. <laughs> I mean, it's we, we well, can. Case, well, my case, I'm at eleven a.m. Oh, yeah, love it. <laughs> My day is just only halfway gone now. <laughs> so, but it's fantastic so I, listening to you talk. I mean, there's so much knowledge that you gain from just listening to both well, you guys. This, I, I'm sorry that it takes four. The last hour was two hours, 40 minutes. This time is four hours. Four hours. I, I think we're going to piss off a lot of people after yeah, a while. I mean, a lot of people have left already. <laughs> I was <laughs> left. So, yeah, then there's maybe. people like Keith and Guillaume and Sam oh, yeah. who, who stuck it out all the way through. And it's like, guys, Thank you much for having such good uh, listening power. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank both of you for having such a wonderful session. And we well, could like maybe hold the next one whenever you guys are ready. And then we'll continue with our home theater design. I, I, speak about I, I, all the hows and the whys of why we're doing certain things. Yeah. Well, ne next time, let's, uh, let's. Uh, I don't know, John, do you want to do these separately or do you want to do them together again? I I don't know. Um Maybe we no, I'm, I'm, I was going to come up with a joke, but I couldn't. I was say, maybe, maybe we should do them separately, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind, really, honestly. I don't mind either way. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, 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 I really I, tried not to do this. <laughs> we, we're, we're still getting around to our design, Ron. Of our no, it's theater. okay. We still no, it's need okay. to know where because, our sounds go and where the Atmos speakers go. <laughs> what this is all about is about teaching and learning. No, no, we, no, all, no. we all learn and while we're teaching. All of us do. And the people that listen to this will learn a lot. And that's all that I care about, honestly. I don't care about yeah. the, the, the 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 highlight or whatever. I'm going to put this on my 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 YouTube channel when I get the video when it's done too. Yes, so, same way here um, too. So so if, if mm -hmm. my entire thing is if you when you do these things to get them ready for YouTube, please send us a copy of them oh, in so you know so. in, in in 1080 or whatever it is, and, yeah. and give it to us so we can download it. And I can put it on my website. Sure. This, okay. this 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 file this file is going to be a very heavy file. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, you have to I probably have, break I, it up into four parts of one hour each. I, I have yes. I have six I have sixty four terabytes of storage. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to close the session. Uh, thank Alrighty. you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just been fantastic again. Uh, thank you all who've stayed uh, for four hours with us. I mean, I, I've, I'm I'm actually energetic. I don't want to go to sleep. I wanted to continue this well, discussion. I know I'm going to be up till three for sure because I get wound up <laughs> with dark, in, in doing this. And Ron, so, yeah. look what you've done to us, Thank Ron. I can just much. see phase. I can see phase <laughs> balloons of diffusers. Now. That's all I can see. <laughs> hey. Welcome to my dreams. <laughs> That's why I have to take a nap at three o'clock in the afternoon every day because my mind is like, uh, because, because, well, I'm sorry, because I, I do most of my work, believe it or not, at night. So I, I, I'm actually up from about from about uh, 10 or 11 in the evening until about four in the morning doing this. And then I sleep for a couple more hours. <laughs> so, you know, so I don't have I don't have a sleep schedule. I have a. Uh, 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 what do you call it? A vampire schedule? Vampire schedule. Yeah. Yeah. My my schedule is 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 you know, um, well, you can you can sleep when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I am too. J J John knows he and I have been around each other long enough. Where if I see that I have a green dot on the uh, messenger, he's uh -huh. going to get a phone call. <laughs> it's, it's like he may be in the middle of eating or having lunch or having a nap or whatever but he's getting a phone call <laughs> uh -huh. so we talked i think we talked to each other probably four or five times a day now fantastic fantastic yeah it's so. all, all in uh, aid of science and it's fantastic what you guys are doing well, and i'm so glad that we can be part of this and Karthik, well I, we, we appreciate you guys today. doing this because awesome. there's nobody out there that would do this <laughs> no, no. It's, yeah, it's master, class very, master class is very important to all of us out here. I'm just very disappointed that not many more people attended. I mean, we have a very large fraternity, AV fraternity out here in India, and 
And normally they do attend these classes, but I don't know. Maybe well, it's, it's a Saturday was, night yeah. and they wanted to go partying. Maybe, I don't know. Or or, or maybe it's four hours long. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, then we, we didn't know when we started out, right? We were going to get done with that home terror quickly. <laughs> yeah, this, this is why I, a lot of you guys, you know, like uh, Fennel and stuff like that, they all, they all say the same thing, that yeah. put it on YouTube because then we can watch it at our leisure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and break it into pieces and stuff. But, is, but in reality... By, by posting these things, guys, you're doing the whole industry a service. And yeah. we really do appreciate that That's because true. without you guys, there's a lot of the stuff would never get out. No, no, no. Absolutely. We That's really true. appreciate that. So we, we'll yeah, share, we we'll share some more. Yeah, we'll share more data with you as as we get a chance to talk about it more. That's and I, I can put it in, into better graphic form so it's easier to see. It, like that, those those balloons are so fantastic. You immediately can know what that diffuser is doing. You know that that's that's brilliant. I think that's fantastic. Well, and it should wait, become wait. a standard, and more should well, be. You know, measured. I'll tell you what. Next time we do this, we have taken these balloons and animated them. Okay. Okay. So you can actually watch the sound move in the room, and hit these diffusers and diffuse and do things, and we can actually nice. show you. These Very are these are simulations. These are predictions based upon measurements, mm -hmm. nice. and and we can show you a uh, barrel. We can show you a a QRD. We can show you all those things, the differences, and these are all done by one of the guys that we're working with, uh, and they take three or four days to create each one. It's it's but, it's very high computation, very very uh, computationally yes, intensive. Yeah. Well, he's he's using a cray. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. Yeah, so it so we're only showing a, yeah, we're only showing about three tenths of a second of time. Right. But it takes about about a minute and a half to look at it. Okay. Okay. So when we come up next time, I'll have a few of these up on the thing that we can we can uh, click on and you can actually watch what happens. And okay. we have in comparison so you can actually put them in a room and see how they work in a room. That'll be super. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. So if you guys think that these balloons are great, wait till you see these things. John John seen and he knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so yeah, we'll, let we'll, we'll me, yeah, let me just conclude by saying that uh, we are really indebted uh, to the two of you for uh, sparing your time and uh, taking this session. It's it's uh, it's all in the aid of science, as you said, uh, Marzi. But I think. Uh, uh, being able to talk to uh, basically two colossus, uh, two colossi is something that uh, oh. we, we should be really grateful to. And uh, totally, course, totally grateful. We are so humbled. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are really humbled. Guys, and, uh, please don't refer to us as colossus because you remember what happened at the colossus of Rhodes. No, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so it's exactly it fell, what it fell I, down. It's, it's exactly it what down. it's. Like, I know, so uh, it's it's our way of acknowledging the fact that we are talking to domain experts. So as as John pointed out last time, it's it's a question of the other side calling you an expert rather than you calling yourself. So I would I would still acknowledge uh, uh, that uh, that expertise, and it's it's our duty to acknowledge that. Uh, so as as we, we appreciate the expert. Okay. Uh, I know from my point of view, every time I hear Colossus, I think to myself, yes, and a few years later, the earthquake took it down and it fell right in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a Colossus. I, I don't mind all, being an expert. All I can say, Ron, all I can say is that, all I can say is that uh, science is, uh, is uh, supreme. And so we just have to, we are just uh, uh, students yeah. of science and uh, students of science. And that's all that matters. Yeah. And so as long as you call me a scientist, I'm happy. All right. <laughs> okay. You, you you've got the data. You've got the data to prove it that you're a scientist. You got it. It's like it's like yeah. Argue with the data. Don't argue with me. I don't care. Exactly. <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah. So John and I will talk. But I would imagine you know if you don't uh, as often as you guys want to have us, we're probably going to be available. Mm, that'd be fun. Because because be I mean, our job, both of us, is educate. Right. Period. That's what um, we do. I, I I'm 77 years old. i John is much younger than I am. And uh, seven uh, years I'll, younger. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's much. <laughs> My point is, 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 you know, all we have left is to educate other people because whatever research we've done will disappear when we die if we don't educate other people. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Right. So, and I hate to see that happen because there's a lot of time involved in that. <laughs> okay. You've got to educate, but you've got to publish as well. You need to publish those papers. And uh, I hate That's, writing with a passion. <laughs> I've been on him. I've been on him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. On it. We're working on it. Uh, Microsoft's got I, a very good text to speech converter, speech to text converter. So you could just dictate it to your computer and then type it up. Or use yeah. Chat GPT. Maybe. My, 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 <laughs> my daughter keeps telling me that she's, she's an author and she's published like 35 books. And oh, she wow. keeps telling me, she said, Dad, she said, please just write it, just talk about it and let the computer figure it out. Exactly. And I'm kind of going, uh, 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 uh. So, uh, so somebody said, well, these things that we're doing right now, we could break that up and take these and break them up into small pieces and put them together into a uh, uh, a uh, video book. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, it's called you know they have these uh, AI things where if you have a right. question, you ask the question, and then you know me when I'm 25 years dead, I can answer the question in video. <laughs> <laughs> like the rings. So who knows? Yeah, yes. like the rings in in the time machine. Yeah, yes, yeah, the rings in the time machine. <laughs> so who knows, Kartik? Maybe may we'll have to depend on you to write the book. Yeah, <laughs> Kartik, you can take that up. <laughs> I'm always there to support you, bro. <laughs> and and the youngest in the lot. So I hope that uh, I I I take this. Yeah, it's it it'll be a real honor to do that. But yeah. We'll we'll keep at it. I, all I can say is that uh, we'll. I look forward to having the next session whenever uh, John and Ron, whenever you agree. Well, so, let's find out whether let's find out whether your audience wants to come and listen to us anymore. <laughs> I, I, yeah, don't, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that that's the issue, uh, uh, John and Ron. I think it's just a question of you uh, having your dates sorted out, and we are good to go from your uh, from same, our side. Same time in a couple of weeks, I can do it. Okay. Yeah, I can do it in a couple of weeks again too. So I would say that uh, I would say that maybe uh, you guys uh, discuss among the two of you, and we'll we'll be ready when you are. Okay. I'd say I'd say maybe first or second week of June. No, that'd would be, be good. great. Great. Yeah, I think yeah, we I think need to allow we need to allow people to assimilate and absorb. Yeah, the, actually, the, yeah, uh, actually digest <laughs> what they've taken tonight. So today, it, today was a today was a very heavy dose of uh, information. I think uh, yeah. it'll take a lot of time for people to absorb because a lot of things have been unlearned today. Today, uh, in terms of uh, the what people already know about uh, acoustics and uh, absorption yeah. and diffusion. It, so it, I think it, a lot it, of unlearning. Shapes. Yeah, it, 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 it takes I more time. I a lot about absorption shapes and, and yeah, it, balloons. Oh my god! Look, guys, the simple facts are: unlearning is harder than learning is. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Okay, because it's two. This is two step thing. You have to unlearn, and then you have to relearn. Right. You know, learning is one one part of it, but unlearning is very difficult right. to do. And right. and 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 this is this particular method that we're using here. I would imagine these people are all going to go home. And they're going to have to decompress, kind of like going and diving under the ocean and having to come <laughs> back at a thousand feet. Okay, nice. they'll spend a lot of time in decompression. <laughs> okay, Maybe. so it is. So it's I, the it's the way you have to be when you do something like this. You have to do set your bias aside and be ready to change your mind when you absolutely. when you go into a, a, a lecture or something. You go to okay. I, I I know these things and I think I know them, but I'm ready to change my mind. I'm gonna, you know, so you you know, like the like the little uh, uh, like the mutant said in 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 Total Recall, open your mind, open your <laughs> mind. You remember that one? <laughs> so, yeah. It, you got to. You know, the other you, thing is, you got it. You know, yeah, John so, and I so, are both willing to say, look, we were wrong. The 706 proved that to us both. Okay, we both had yeah. the same idea that it wouldn't do low frequency very well. It wouldn't do this. It wouldn't do that. And by testing it, we both had to sit there and eat crow. Yeah. Okay. Even on even on Facebook, it was like, okay, guys, we were wrong. This is probably a better than the <laughs> other side thing. You have no idea. At some point, at, at our age, it's kind of like, oh God, here we were wrong again. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? And, and and the older we get, the more wrong we are, more often. You know, and, and, and all you can do is throw it away, and pick it back up and relearn it and go back and say, OK, guys, we were wrong. Here's the latest data. And will it change in the future? Maybe, maybe, but it hasn't right now. This is the latest yeah. information we have. And all yeah. we can do is teach the latest information we have. And at some point, if better information comes by, hey, uh, you teach it to me, you show me what it is. I'll be happy to look at all the data. If the data says yes. 
then I have to change whatever I'm doing because that's the facts, whether I like it or not. Right. Yeah. And, and you have to have people willing to do that. And John is very willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. I'll argue until I'm blue in the face on my point of view until you show me that I'm wrong. And when I'm wrong, it's like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, I'm wrong. So, yeah, okay, let's go with yours and I'll throw <laughs> mine away. You know, but, but, but you damn well better be able to show that I'm wrong. At the, end of the day, at the end of the day, Ron, uh, science has to win and science will win. That's the whole point. That, that's the whole point is, is facts do matter. Right. And science doesn't care what you think. <laughs> right. It's absolutely, it's absolutely, uh, it's, 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 it's agnostic to what you think. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, there's, there, there, there was a science fiction book. Uh, I'm trying to remember, was it Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Uh, science is very harsh <laughs> it doesn't care <laughs> if it hurts your feelings sorry about that get over it <laughs> okay so yeah so both john and i are both believers in in science and it doesn't matter what you think or what you think you know or what your interpretation of it is or what your extension of of a science fact is but one of the problems is we come up with a simple fact and then people run with it like crazy and extend it 15 different directions where it may or may not extend those directions. Okay. Hmm. So that's one of the things that happens is we do all this extension. Like, you know, we'll say, well, it does this. Well, if it does it for six feet, it must do it for nine feet too. Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> okay. Right. You know, right. so, and that's what we do all of our measuring for is to prove, you know, uh, how far can we carry this or how far can we not carry this? Right. Okay. So, so yeah. Thank you very much for giving us this uh, this uh, uh, method platform. of uh, platform. We yeah, must. We we can only only thank you, uh, Ron and John. So yeah, uh, we are just a medium in trying to get this uh, knowledge out to well, the world. So we are just. Uh, thank you just for the media. Yeah, we are trying thank our best. The, yeah, thank you for the medium because it used to be thank all we you. could do was reach a few people in, in a classroom, right. and that was it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we can reach hundreds of people this way, or thousands of people, especially right. on YouTube. Yeah, you because know, right. if it goes on YouTube, it must be for it must be real. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You know, especially it, it, especially it, like four hours long. You know, <laughs> well, it's right. like when we're working. You know, Ron mentioned to me earlier. You know, you you, you know, uh, acoustics acoustics doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like that one. Huh? There's <laughs> I a profound I talking statement. about that. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah. There's no acoustics in the vacuum. <laughs> <There's> no acoustics. <laughs> <in the vacuum. laughs> so just all right, so guys. Closing yeah. up. Yeah. Just yeah. one last thing. If you know, remember to talk about the Elrad that was used in the Avengers movie, the Hulk. If you. Oh remember. yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it was used in the yeah. Hulk. <laughs> all I know is I got him up here and I unpacked him and I put him up. And I went down the end of my test building at 700 feet, and I thought I was going to get my head ripped off. All right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because we were projecting it down the length of it. And usually you go just a few, a couple meters past, and it's, it drops down to 50, 60 dB. And it was like, I'm sorry, but I measured it at the surface, and then I measured it out there, and it only dropped like three or four dB over 600 feet. Wow. And it was like, what the heck <laughs> you know and then i realized what it was it was the focusing function mm -hmm. you know and then we yeah. started looking at it and it's like we do lasers and stuff and coherent you know, beam yeah it's a coherent beam and that's coherent beams are scary what they can do yeah, yeah. you know there's there's some things coming that, that that we can we i can't really talk about too much right. other than the fact right. that, that, that they are coming yeah, and, they're coming. Uh, they're coming. Yeah. The, yeah. I know. I know about this. Uh, this uh, being from the uh, that industry too. So yeah. The yeah. So you, yeah. There's things coming in lasers and weapons and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't think I want to be in the other end of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like no. Uh, so you know, I, I always tell John. I always complain about being 77 years old. Uh, in some ways, I'm happy I am. Because I may not have to live through some of that stuff. <laughs> and on that cheery note, <laughs> yes, let's go. Let's go on our way now. Okay. So Be thanks. Good. So good night. Good, good night. Take care. Good, good night, night, John. Good, good day, everyone. Everyone. Good and uh, good thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.